All right, everyone, it's 10 a.m. Good morning, and good morning to everyone across California and the entire practice of water reuse community here. Good day to those of you who are joining us elsewhere outside of California. This is Kevin Hardy. I'm the executive director of the National Water Research Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to, the, to day two of the first meeting of the state of California's expert panel to review regulations proposed by the state water board to regulate the water reuse practice known as direct potable reuse or DPR here in the Golden State. Please advance the slide and actually we can go two slides ahead. So welcome to day two. Here's our panel. Uh, well, I thought we had a good day yesterday. This uh, we, we, we spent a little bit of time. Uh, not only do we finish on time, which I think it's always in good to, to, to respect everybody's uh, schedule because it's such a, a busy and important group, not only here on the call, but across the, 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 the community. Uh, but I thought we did a good job of establishing the initial rapport with the panel. I think we spent the right amount of time kind of developing the issue background in enough context so that folks had a shared understanding of kind of the how we got here. Um, we got a little glimpse inside of life on a nuclear submarine. Um, we understand, I think we have a real clear picture of where uh, this panel's work uh, fits into uh, the, the very complicated administrative procedure that uh, is required to adopt a regulation here in California. And I think we began to see um, the kind of the outlines of the tasks ahead. So a successful day yesterday. And I wanna thank the panelists, the co-chairs and all the presenters uh, for their attention to detail and for, for helping everyone uh, be done on time. Next slide. Uh, here are uh, objectives for meeting two. Uh, we really covered the first two yesterday uh, and, and we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper on bullet two today. Uh, the big concepts today, are we're going to receive some public comments after uh, a, a little bit more of a deeper dive on uh, some of the DPR research. We're going to receive some public comments and then we're going to spend some time in closed session and start to hash out how this work is going to uh, work forward. Next slide. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, we've, uh, we, we we're in the middle of our login and, or well, from our, our welcome and review and we'll get through that as quickly as possible. Uh, then we're gonna then we're gonna introduce uh, Jean-Francois Debru and Shane Trussell, and they're gonna go over the findings and recommendations from the DPR4 project, which is critical to the panel's work. Then at 10:50, we'll switch uh, to the DDW project team. They've got a next uh, their next presentation on the issue of chemicals. Uh, we've got some room for clarifying questions from the panel, and then we'll take a lunch break. We'll continue the Q&A from the panel until about 12:30, and then at one o'clock sharp. Um, we've got a public comment session. Right now, there are about uh, eight public comments that I, uh, commenters that I've seen. Uh, so we should have time to accommodate them all. We're just going to receive comments today. There's nothing that the panel needs to do in terms of a real-time response, but certainly anything that's uh, presented by a, a public commenter is an issue that the panelists may want to take under consideration. Uh, 1.30, we'll go into our working session. And at two o'clock, we're going to do a adjourn day two. So next slide. Uh, same ground rules as yesterday is patient format. I think we did great yesterday. Uh, I think we, you know, keep yourself muted unless you, you're, you're, you're needing or wanting to speak. I like the idea. Uh, it, it makes sense to me. Uh, if you feel like if you have a question, sometimes I miss those raised hands, the electronic cues. So if you turn your camera on, that's certainly easier for me and I would really appreciate it. So um, also if you're, if you're on go to meeting and you have to log in by phone, make sure you, you put your uh, audio pin and name in there so we know uh, who you are and we can identify you. Uh, do what you can to remain present. Uh, we're gonna focus again today, Q&A periods again, or for the expert panel members today. Uh, remember that first objective, trying to set that baseline of understanding, so we wanna stay there. And uh, if you don't remember, we do record these meetings, and this meeting is, in fact, being recorded. Uh, next slide. Uh, for those who are on the line and who have uh, yet uh, to request to speak, it's, it needs to be done as, as quickly as possible so that we can organize the event. Uh, what's required is to send an email to the address that's on the screen right now, ddwrecycledwater at waterboards.ca.gov. Put DPR criteria expert panel meeting one in the subject line and in the body of the mail, give your name, who you represent, how you're going to attend. And if you're going by telephone, again, we need the, the phone number you're gonna call from, the audio pin and your name. So that's the do's and don'ts for this morning's uh, session i'm looking forward to it uh let's go to the next slide uh and let's move right into the next piece uh, you know now i think you know the next part of our agenda here today 
is to spend uh, some time with uh, uh, two gentlemen who uh, were the principal investigators on uh, DPR Project 4. Uh, today we have Dr. Shane Trussell, who is the president of Trussell Technologies. Uh, he's, Shane, um, not only does he have a PhD from Berkeley and has been involved in our, in our industry for over 20 years, uh, but Shane is one of those folks who's been able to bend the narrative in water reuse. And so we're real pleased to have him here today and uh, someone who's been you know, very influential in this space and uh, is someone that we want to uh, want to take advantage to, to hear from. We also have Jean-Francois Debreu. Uh, Jean is the uh, chief technology officer at Kennedy Jenks. He's been there for over 21 uh, years. He and Shane served on the Water uh, Reuse uh, Foundation Research Advisory Committee for over six years together. Uh, Jean has a PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder and has done some postdoc work at Stanford. We're really blessed to have them here today to talk to us about uh, this. And I think I'm seeing uh, Jean up. So uh, Jean, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, and I, I'd like to thank NWRI and, and the state, DDW, and, and everyone uh, on the expert panel who's who's with us today. I'm going to be presenting our work on DPR4, uh, as Kevin mentioned, with Shane Trussell. Uh, I'll do the first half of the presentation. Shane will do the second half. But I also wanted to acknowledge Megan Plumley and Orange County Water District, as she was uh, very valuable for for this work. And, and we used a lot of data from Orange County Water District to try to understand what we're doing here. We're going to try to cover the motivations, uh, the results, and the recommendations. We only have 25 minutes, so we're gonna we're gonna try to move quickly. But um, but uh, all of this information is in the report that was published uh, in the spring of this year. So all this information is is available uh, through the Water Research Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. So the motivation, really, really quickly, over the decades that um, that full advanced treatment or MFROUVAOP has been developed uh, for for the removal of contaminants from impaired waters. Uh, it's been found that it's a highly effective uh, treatment train, and that it's and it's employed now for groundwater recharge, but. Um, there have been water quality excursions that have been observed. Uh, the expert panel should uh, recognize the graph on the right. It was from the expert panel report um, that is the RO feed and product water at Orange County Water District data from 2013. And what it shows um, in uh, a, a peak in the RO feed water that was mirrored in the product water, so upwards to six to seven milligrams per liter of TOC was coming out of the RO membrane for approximately uh, a day and a half. So that is that's the motivation of this study that these uh, excursions can be seen. Um, a click, please, Jing. And uh, grab sampling at that time confirmed that the majority of the TOC that was uh, that came through the membranes was uh, acetone at that time. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide, please. So when, when starting this work, we had to identify actually what is a peak. And I've got a graph here that is a, a week's worth of data from Orange County. We looked at about approximately six years of, of data that was collected every couple to few minutes. Uh, so a lot of data. And there was four things that I'd like um, the expert panel to take away from this figure. One is if you'd notice the different uh, uh, y-axis titles, um, the RO feed, uh, the RO, um, excuse me, the RO permeate is approximately two and a half orders of magnitude lower in TOC than the RO feed. Uh, so uh, reverse osmosis membranes do a very good job in removing TOC. Second thing is there's a diurnal variation in the RO feed water, and that's based upon the loading at a wastewater treatment plant, and that is reflected prior to the RO, and that is mimicked in the RO permeate water. So you see a, uh, a variation, a diurnal variation uh, of TOC, albeit at a much, much lower concentration, two and a half orders of magnitude. 
The third thing I'd like to point out is there are outliers. We looked at, again, six years worth of data and approximately 2% of the, of the data were outliers. And you can see those on the blue line uh, earlier in the week uh, where there are, there are values that are uh, unexpected, that are much higher and much lower um, than, than the, the trending TOC values. And the last thing is that in the permeate water, you can see a drift in um, in the uh, in, in the average concentration over time, either increasing in the beginning or decreasing over time, and that can be due from operating uh, the RO facility, how it is being operated, the aging of the membranes, or just the drift of the online instrumentation. Again, these are at low concentrations and at the low end of the analytical capabilities of online TOC analyzers. So with all of these challenges, we had to determine how to handle the data set to determine what a peak is. Next slide, please. So we did that by looking at two different things, the peak height and the peak width. And both are important and both in our report are required to meet certain characteristics to be defined as a peak. So let's talk about the peak height first. We developed a method, actually took one from the literature, um, uh, to, uh, to define a baseline threshold. And because we have these outliers, we don't necessarily have a non, uh, well, normal distribution, and we wanted a, a, a system that all the data could be used, so there would be no subjectivity in picking data. And we used a referenced uh, water quality um, approach to, to define that ba baseline threshold. I'm not gonna get into that during the, during the talk, but it is referenced in our report. So we define a baseline threshold that will take care of all those uh, diurnal variations. They'll remain below that baseline. And then when, we, when it goes above that, that threshold, uh, that is uh, one of the characteristics of a peak. The other one is the peak width. And this is very important because due to non-plug flow processes in the wastewater treatment plant, like equalization basins, primary treatment, aeration basins, and recycle flows within the wastewater treatment plant for uh, enhanced nutrient removal or just for operations. An instantaneous illicit discharge in the collection system will result in a peak width of hours to days. And the peaks that we examined all were over a day, about a day and a half. So even if, again, an illicit discharge is done immediately, it will spread out through the wastewater treatment plant and come to the advanced water treatment facility in a, a, in a broadened peak and not an instantaneous peak. And because of that, we thought that online data collected every 15 minutes um, uh, would be appropriate. Next slide, please. So here is a couple weeks data or a week and a half data from Orange County Water District in 2018. And you see five five potential peaks that, that go above the baseline thresholds. We are testing our approach on actual data from Orange County Water District. Next click, please. And number two was the only one that met the criteria for the peak height and the peak width. Um, the other ones, one, three, four, and five, were above the baseline threshold high enough for a peak height, but did not uh, meet the width. And going back to operations at Orange County Water District, there was an explanation for each one of one, three, four, and five that either had to do with turning on or off RO membranes or having instrument changes at that time. So we felt that our approach um, uh, was able to identify a potential uh, peak and identify um, oh, excursions from the baseline that we do not consider uh, the source as being a, um, an illicit discharge of a chemical. Next slide, please. So after we, we identify the peak, 
we look to the literature to find out what chemicals pass through full advanced treatment. We did that with a two-stage process, the first one being what goes through RO membranes, and the next one is what goes through a UV AOP system because MF uh, membranes do not do uh, do not remove to any significant value any dissolved uh, chemicals. And there has been a lot of work done on RO rejection of organic compounds. As a matter of fact, uh, two of the studies that we used were, were primary authors or are in, on the expert panel. So there's a lot of expertise here. We looked at we looked at bench scale, pilot scale, full scale facilities. We looked at virgin membrane studies and uh, used membrane studies. We talked to membrane manufacturers and uh, looked at their data as far as what was rejected. Some of the key studies are located at the bottom of the table. And because of all those different types of studies and characteristics, there was a bit of spread on some of the rejection percentages for different compounds. So we, so we put them into three different categories, good, intermediate, and poor. And for this, uh, for this approach, we focused on what was poorly removed or less than 50% uh, in the literature um, as, as being poorly removed through RO membranes. Next slide, please. Now we looked at what was uh, poorly or well removed through the AOP process. And the way we did that is we looked at the hydroxyl radical rate constants of uh, particular chemicals and family of chemicals. And we used the hydroxyl radical rate constant of 1,4-dioxane as our threshold. And the reason we did that is 1,4-dioxane is a surrogate for chemical destruction in a UV AOP process currently. So any compounds that have a hydroxyl radical rate constant that is greater than 1,4-dioxane, we consider that to be well removed. And the, the compounds or families of compounds that had a hydroxyl radical rate constants less than 1,4-dioxane, we considered to be poorly removed. And that is reflected on the right-hand side of the, of the uh, top table. And then when you take the intersection of what is poorly removed through RO membranes and what is poorly removed through AOP, you get the bottom table, which is what we're deeming in the study as poorly removed through uh, full advanced treatment. And those are low molecular weight haloalkanes, <clears throat> excuse me, low molecular weight alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, acetonitrile, MITC, and for completeness, we put THMs because other than potentially chloroform, we don't see THMs as a source of uh, illicit discharges. Uh, next click, please. And this has been, uh, we, we compared this table with what it has been seen in the literature, literature at full-scale facilities. And um, it seems to match up well. We're looking at volatile organic compounds. So what has been seen to break through at full-scale facilities is formaldehyde, 1,4-dioxane, and NDMA prior to UVAOP, um, uh, methyl ethyl ketone, and acetone. So we felt that we had a, a, a pretty good hold on what breaks through uh, um, uh, full advanced treatment. Next slide, please. The next part of our charge was to determine what was the best available technology to remove uh, these particular compounds um, or basically additional treatment to full advanced treatment to protect um, from, um, from the breakthrough of these compounds. Unfortunately, there's not a single silver bullet treatment that addresses all of these compounds but we did recommend ozone BAC as pretreatment because that is effective at breaking down uh, compounds uh, and then biodegrading these compounds, air stripping for the more volatile compounds. There are compounds in there that are highly miscible in water and don't air strip well. Activated carbon is, uh, is an effective method for some of these compounds and additional RO AOP treatment. If you remember, 
um, identified less than 50%. So additional, um, a, additional treatment by our ROAOP could reduce that considerably. And we're not necessarily suggesting additional RO and AOP in series, but more in a recirculating mode like is done at Singapore and, is be, and that is capable of being done at uh, Pure Water Monterey. And then there is blending, which if the blending is done with water without these constituents, it's just uh, uh, an arithmetic decrease depending upon the, the flow of the water. So that was the first part of our study. And then we moved into case studies that Shane is going to describe next. Next slide, Shane. Yep. Thank you, John. Um, so we were fortunate, as John mentioned, to have Orange County Water District uh, working with us and participating in this and sharing their their information. Um, the, the largest potable reuse uh, facility in the world. Uh, we also were fortunate to have uh, the Singapore PUB uh, sharing their information and experience on, on chemical peaks and, and managing them as well. Uh, we also finally took a look at the city of San Diego uh, and their experience at the North City uh, water reclamation plant and their demo facility, which has been in operation for the last 10 years. In addition to the case studies, we, we took a look at uh, some of the concepts around chemical peaks um, and, and have created some, some graphics to help us understand uh, what, what different volumes and, and sewer sheds and different scenarios may mean. Next slide, please. So Jean had mentioned this, this is the, the 2013 uh, chemical peak that was observed uh, at Orange County. Um, and you know, the RO permeate went up into above five milligrams per liter of, of uh, TOC. And this was found to be largely acetone. Uh, across here in, in the table, I'm showing the acetone samples that were actually grab samples in the feed and the RO permeate that were collected converting that to TOC, uh, it did represent uh, 78 to 86% of that elevated TOC concentration. So we were able to identify um, that in that 2013 peak that most of it could be attributed to uh, acetone. You can also, I, I think John mentioned this, but the duration, uh, it's, it's more than 20 hours of duration uh, that this chemical peak occurred. It's also important to note this is an IPR project and this really, you know, acetone even at these concentrations is not, not a public health concern, but a, a good indicator that there is chemicals that could pass through the full advanced treatment facility. Next slide. Uh, we, we did run through uh, a lot of Orange County's data through the uh, peak uh, calculation that John went over earlier. Um, and, and it's important to note that there are peaks that you're going to need to identify operationally that John mentioned. So some of these peaks are just caused by RO trains uh, being shut down. And when they're shut down, uh, you get diffusion of the TOC into the RO permeate, which increases the, the TOC in that RO permeate train while it's offline. And so you see these spikes uh, when, when new trains are brought online. So it'll be important to identify those. But there were still some other uh, chemical peaks that, that have been observed at Orange County. And I'm, I'm sharing here one of them from 2018, which there was more sampling uh, collected. You can see on the right side there, uh, the RO permeate uh, only peaked at 0.24 milligrams per liter of TOC, so a much, much smaller peak. Um, and, and while this particular uh, plot uh, was not identified as the source of the acetone. It was confirmed it was acetone. There was another event uh, actually earlier in October uh, with a similar height and peak uh, that the source working with Orange County Sanitation District, uh, OCWD, was able to identify uh, the source of that chemical peak, which was isopropyl alcohol, about 700 gallons of isopropyl alcohol that was uh, spilled uh, due to an operational error uh, at a food processing facility. Um, and as that breaks down, that becomes acetone. Um, so uh, they have, through their uh, collaboration together, been able to identify uh, some of these chemical peaks, but there are others that remain unidentified. 
Next slide. As to their source. Um, we also worked, as, as I mentioned earlier, with Singapore. They have these, these four water reclamation plants, the, the Kranji, the Jurong, Ulo Pandem, and the Changi. Uh, most of the work that we, we did was really focused on the Kranji facility and, and the Jurong facility. Next slide. Singapore does not have uh, a federal pretreatment program like we do here in the United States. Um, and so they've, they've been developing uh, their list of, of compounds that are prohibited. Um, and as you can see here, a lot of these compounds would be those type of compounds that would be of concern uh, to a, a reuse facility with full advanced treatment. Uh, these, are, these are volatile in nature and able to pass through uh, the full advanced treatment process. Next slide. Uh, one of the one of the very interesting things that Singapore has done uh, was installing and implementing a a online uh, metering program out in their sewer shed. Uh, they installed BOC monitoring devices in the sewer shed uh, in the Jurong uh, collection system area, and uh, they were very effective at reducing the number of of VOC incidents uh, that occurred. Uh, so really demonstrating the power of, of such a, a system to be able to track down and really uh, reduce the, the number of incidents that occurred. Um, then since uh, this work, uh, they've, they've begun to move away from the VOC monitoring in the sewer shed and began to look at um, microbial electrochemical sensors uh, which uh, are, are hoping to allow them to capture uh, even more of the, the VOCs and hopefully do it at, at a more uh, reasonable cost with less maintenance. There's a lot of uh, costs and maintenance associated with these uh, VOC monitoring devices, although they're very effective. Next slide. I'll be covering a little bit later uh, the results of some of the work that was done at the San Diego uh, demonstration facility, but importantly, uh, some spike challenge work was done um, using acetone, NDMA, formaldehyde, and 1-4-dioxane, so, so chemicals that have been documented uh, to pass through uh, full advanced treatment, um, and really looked at and contrasted and compared uh, a, a treatment train with ozone BAC uh, as pretreatment and to an, a full advanced treatment facility. Um, and it concentrations there across the bottom of, of how much uh, was challenged. Next slide. One of the things that we did uh, was begin to think about volumes of, of potential illicit discharges. Um, here we've got uh, into a 10 million gallon uh, sewer shed, what the impacts of, of different uh, volumes of an illicit discharge would be from a tanker truck, which is 4,500 gallons, to an acetone drum, which is 55 gallons, to a one-gallon uh, laboratory size bottle of, of acetone. As you can see, um, anything larger than the one-gallon uh, acetone bottle would, would be noticed and observed uh, at the facility. And uh, also, you know, even the, the 700 gallons uh, was, was noticed uh, of isopropyl alcohol. At, at Orange County, which has has a very large flow uh, of uh, greater than 100 million gallons uh, coming to it per day. Next slide. The other thing that we noted was just the the size of a collection system. So the the larger the facility, the more flow coming to the facility, the less likely it is to be uh, impacted by uh, an illicit discharge. And this is indicated here comparing a 10 million gallon sewer shed to a 100 million gallon sewer shed, looking at that uh, 4,500 gallons of acetone being illicitly discharged. Next slide. Also important is, is where, where the illicit discharge occurs in relative distance uh, from the uh, water reclamation plant. Um, and the closer it is, the more you're going to see a higher chemical spike, and it's going to be more immediate. And uh, the, the further away it is, uh, the more uh, attenuated that, 
that spike will be as it mixes with other other flows, um, and and eventually uh, is received and observed at the at the facility. So both of these are the same masses. Just gives you a sense of of the 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 importance of the the distance from from the uh, wastewater treatment plant. Next slide. I mentioned earlier the San Diego data. Um, so what we've done here is we developed a uh, an example of of removals using the removals that were observed from that uh, demonstration work. Uh, we've got an overall influent TOC spike of up to five milligrams per liter. It's 100 pounds of, of chemical, 25 of acetone, formaldehyde, and and one for dioxane. You can see as you go through the full advanced treatment, which is shown across the top, uh, you have very effective removal of NDMA uh, and one for dioxane. Um, but really, for the most part, the acetone uh, and the formaldehyde are largely passing through the full advanced treatment. Uh, and we still observe a TOC spike of 2.4 milligrams per liter. With the ozone BAC pretreatment shown across the bottom, uh, we increase our removal of, of all the compounds. Uh, we still do have some acetone coming through, so we've removed about two thirds of the acetone. We've removed more than 90% of the formaldehyde, and we've essentially taken the NDMA and the one for doxane down to non-detects with the additional removal that is offered by the ozone BAC. Next slide. Another thing that we did was think about the engineered buffer uh, or, or storage tanks or where, where this purified water gets delivered and its ability to attenuate these chemical peaks. We took the Orange County event from the 2013 and we modeled it really as two step inputs, uh, which fairly closely uh, tracks the way that uh, influent uh, of acetone came in. Uh, so we have a step, a 10 hour step uh, at 0.9 milligrams per liter and another 10 hour step at 5.7 milligrams per liter. Uh, these are engineered tanks of 24 hours, 12 hours, six hours, and three hours. And you can see that while it helps to have additional volume, uh, this this uh, TOC event would still cause a significant uh, increase in the overall output coming out of the engineered buffer uh, with even the 24-hour tank uh, seeing more than two milligrams per liter of TOC uh, and with the three-hour tank offering very little uh, in terms of uh, buffering ability uh, to manage this chemical peak. Next slide. However, as we get out towards larger volume, uh, which is any, anything less than 60 days of residence time uh, in a reservoir is considered direct potable reuse. And this was a conversation yesterday uh, about the differences between raw water and, and treated water augmentation. What we're showing here is a one day uh, buffer, environmental buffer, 10 day, uh, 30 day, and then 60 day. So we've moved from hours to days here. And you can see that as we get to 10 days even, uh, we're able to keep, even with a, a TOC input as large as that 2013 event, we're able to keep the TOC from exceeding the half milligram per liter, uh, which has been a, a regulatory criteria from the groundwater recharge regulations and also the surface water augmentation regulations. And as we get to larger reservoirs, that, that attenuation of this, this peak is even, even better. You really wouldn't even barely see it. Next slide. Another thing that we thought about was the online TOC analyzers. Uh, we've got uh, a couple different types. There's some that work by UV per sulfate and others that work by uh, uh, like an advanced oxidation reaction with ozone and hydroxide. Uh, the expert panel had expressed some concerns that uh, highly volatile organics might not be captured with these online TOC analyzers. So we took a look at that in this project. Next slide. This work was really led by SNWA as a, as a subtask, um, and the principal investigator was Eric Dickinson. Uh, we, we considered a lot of different compounds. They're all listed here. Um, and really, in the end, uh, we selected five. Uh, for a lot of the trial work that was done. We also looked at different analyzers. Next slide. 
And really, as we were choosing and selecting what, what compounds to look at, we were trying to cover two aspects. One is ensuring the compounds had a range of volatility, uh, as shown here with the, with the various uh, Henry's Laws constant, and then also ensuring that the compounds had a range of uh, essentially uh, oxidizability, so how, how well oxidized they could be. Uh, and we were, we were looking at that using the, the hydroxyl radical rate constant making sure we had variation, variations on both of those. Next slide. So uh, a lot of participants, Orange County Water District participated, the city of San Diego, uh, both with their online and, and laboratory units. Uh, manufacturers participated, so we had Suez, which is the original Sievers uh, TOC analyzer, uh, Shimadzu and Hawk. We also had Valley Water participate with their online analyzer and SNWA with their desktop analyzer. Uh, there was more than uh, 400 samples analyzed uh, for different TOCs, so spiked and then, and then analyzed uh, to, to check the TOC concentrations. And in general, the results uh, demonstrated acceptable performance for the measurement of even some of these volatile compounds, assuming that the Henry's law, the Henry constant remained below uh, 0.133, and uh, we were able to see recoveries of at least 50%. Next slide. So in, in wrapping this up, you know, there's a lot of different chemical control strategies that we can use, enhanced source control, online sewer shed monitoring, nitrification, denitrification and filters, ozone BAC pretreatment, response time, having diversions, blending, uh, which is the mixing of, of the purified water with another water, and then dilution, which dilution is uh, putting in off-spec water into water that is on-spec to essentially dilute down that, that off-spec event, which is really the, the basis of the surface water regulations here in California. Next slide. So there's a lot of way to fill this box in chemical control with that to provide us with that public health protection. Next slide. And move forward one more time. Yep. And so with, uh, I'm going to cover a couple examples. One is where the reservoir is too small um, and now it, it's considered direct potable. Uh, we would still be observing a lot of dilution uh, going into that reservoir as covered in that earlier example. So dilution would play a large role in providing this chemical control protection. So moving forward, click, click forward, we, we would also have response time from, from that reservoir, additional response time due to the, the benefits of that environmental bear and buffer. Um, and then we, we could also build up our components with a little bit of diversion, uh, source control, having good, good treatment ahead, NDN filters, um, and the ozone BAC. On the other end of the spectrum, which is kind of talked about as well, let's click forward, we would have a treated water augmentation project. So this is the direct delivery of this advanced treated supply in the potable water distribution system. So clicking forward, this type of project is not going to have the benefits of, of dilution. It's also not gonna have the benefits of response time uh, that was talked about earlier. Um, as well in yesterday's conversation. So it's going to have to make up for that with diversions, enhanced source control, um, good pretreatment with NDN filters, ozone BAC, and perhaps also online sewer shed monitoring. So just wanted to really contrast these two. And yet, as you look at the different builds, quick forward, these are really providing us still an equivalent uh, protection uh, in terms of our chemical control, just using different different techniques. So with that, um, I think we'd like to click forward and go over quickly our recommendations. Um, and John, I believe you're you're going to talk about talk about these first few. Yes, and um, just wanted to let the expert panel know that these recommendations are in the final chapter of the report and in the um, in the executive summary as well. And I, I know we, we've shown you a lot of pictures and run through a lot of data. Uh, and, and now we have the boring text heavy slides, but, but we think that these are important to, to discuss here 
really briefly. So I'm just going to read down through these. The, the, the first four is a, a definition of a chemical peak um, is recommended to differentiate normal facility variation in water quality from true chemical peaks. Um, in this study, chemical peaks are defined as resulting from intentional or unintentional illicit discharges of chemicals to the sewer shed. We believe that that was our charge to, to look at th that type of a scenario and defining the peak is vital to identifying that versus uh, typical operational um, activities. Online monitoring of TOC is recommended as a feasible option for capturing chemical peaks. Uh, Shane showed the, uh, the, the data from what the experimental portion of our project. And TOC is already used as a critical control point monitoring device for RO systems uh, related to compliance. So, so we, our recommendation is to continue using online TOC. Um, Recommendation number three, experimental results suggest that commercially available TOC analyzers have the ability to detect chemical peaks originating from volatile organic compounds. Um, amongst the TOC meters that were tested, at least two models demonstrated acceptable performance and are recommended for DPR projects. And the details of that are summarized in chapter six, but the full report from SNW uh, a is in the appendix of that report. And then the fourth recommendation is, given that chemical peaks are expected to last on the orders of hours to days, no more frequent than a 15 minute minimum sampling interval is recommended for the online TOC analyzers. Um, next slide, please. And Shane. Yeah, so continuing on, due to the very limited expected frequency of chemical peaks, it was less than a half percent of the case study data evaluated. Periodic grab sampling for compounds known to potentially escape fat is not recommended for the purpose of discovering this illicit discharge. So we, we're, we're discouraging a lot of sampling uh, and really then moving to point six, utilities should prepare a formal TOC response protocol so in the event of a TOC spike as part of that protocol, a grab sample would be recommended. Uh, so then you could uh, confirm that the TOC analyzer is reading correctly and also identify possible chemicals uh, and then communicate with the source control program to work on tracking that down. Point seven, an enhanced source control program is recommended for DPR that proactively deters and diminishes the occurrence of chemical discharges and a tailored source control monitoring program can help identify the source of an illicit uh, discharge. Point eight, uh, additional treatment barriers as covered in our slide deck uh, in conjunction with that should be considered to increase robustness and further reduce the concentration of chemical constituents. Uh, the barriers include ozone BAC, air stripping, activated carbon, uh, and additional treatment through recirculation, uh, as John mentioned earlier. Next slide, and done at existing facilities. Last two here, so DPR applications that have the option to use a small reservoir should consider doing so, given the benefits of the small reservoir for chemical peak averaging due to blending. And then utilities considering DPR should pursue a balanced approach to control chemical peaks that includes an appropriate combination of two or more of the following, the source control enhanced monitoring, such as sewer shed monitoring, uh, additional treatment barriers and or blending. And with that, I think we'd be happy to take any questions. Maybe acknowledge our research team, <laughs> Stephen Timko, Rod Rodrigo Tacker, Alex Pizarenko, Stephen Timko with KJ and Rodrigo and Alex with Trussell Tech. Uh, the collaboration with, with Adam and Jim throughout this, uh, the careful review, comments and data from Mayhole, greatly appreciated. Um, and, and WRF for their support uh, as we went through and did all the work on the project. Thank you. Shane, John, thank you so much. That was a really good presentation. I think it covered a lot of really good points that uh, not only are supported by all the hard work you did, but also by the anecdotal experience of people who have run wastewater treatment plants for, for, for years. So I appreciate uh, the, the, the insight of that research so much. Um, 
Mr. Crook and Mr. Olivieri, uh, we do have maybe five minutes on the schedule. We could take questions now and we might have one or two, um, or we could wait until the, uh, the, 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 the question session uh, at, that's scheduled for 1150. What's your pleasure? I think we could take a few now, Kevin, while still hot and numb brains. I, I, have, I, have a, Excellent. I have a general question. Um, Shane, you mentioned um, Singapore and how, I, I, I think I have this correct, that they're, get, they, they're considering getting away from the TOC monitors and going to some other, other method. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, and not the TOC, the VOC, the volatile organic. Oh, the, the VOC, okay. Yeah. That answers my question then. <laughs> no, they, they're, they've got a lot of TOC analyzers and use those and depend on those. Good, okay, thank you. Other questions from anyone? I see Chuck is, is, is here. So Shane, you saw some spikes that didn't meet your definition of peaks because they weren't wide enough, correct? Y yes, we saw those as well. So yeah. what do you think those are from? So th those, quite honestly, most of the, um, the sort of noise we get, uh, uh, for the most part, appears to be like a train coming online or offline. I would say that's probably our one of our greatest examples, other than the meter deviating or drifting on its own. That's why Orange County has gone to having, and Singapore has it too, uh, two meters, uh, so that you, you're better able to track okay. and discern if if one is just drifting and the other one, or if they're both giving you the same value. That's why when we showed those chemical peaks, they're they're both tracking. Um, and so there, therefore we, we know it's, it's real, but I, I think it's really important for DDW to hear as well that, you know, when a train's offline, the, the RO permeate of that train is, is, is increasing in TOC. And that's just happening through natural diffusion. When that train's brought back online, it, it will spike our, our effluent meter. Um, well, so should there be a protocol that when you bring a train that's been stagnant online that you waste a certain several minutes of flow yeah I, that could be talked about i think there's additional costs and implications you know sure. valves and um sure a lot of infrastructure associated with that so what's the real value i i feel like the the online measurements we're doing are to track um you know any any sort of like the title here to to address uh known deviations from what's normal and if it's kind of just a startup i i'm not sure that that's warranted but um could, could unless you were also about. getting chemicals of concern that were sloughing off at the same time that your toc was sloughing off during restart yep True. Interesting question. Indeed. I can tell you that uh, meters and monitors drifting is a, the bane of the wastewater treatment plants. <laughs> it's just difficult to manage and it sends you in all kinds of crazy directions and you're wrong. So uh, any other questions here before we move on? I think we're kind of interested. I, I, I have one question. Uh, to Shane and John, great presentation. Uh, did you notice any uh, differences or any correlations with peak flow rates or different times of day? Well, there's definitely the diurnal variation of the uh, of the TOC concentration in the recycled water, the post you know, wastewater treatment plant water that's reflected of the, the loading that goes on during the day. The advanced water treatment facility does not take all the flow from the wastewater treatment plant and typically runs at a constant flow rate. So there, there is no peaking um, 
as far as the advanced water treatment facility and the flux rates associated with the membranes, um, we did not look at seasonal seasonal um, events uh, as far as uh, the you know storm events or anything that could increase the flow at the wastewater treatment plant. We just kind of focused in on the on the on the you know weak time frame and diurnal variations. And Great, uh, I'll, I'll add a, a little, George. You know, North City does have flow EQ, and they're running that plant constant flow. We still observe that diurnal pattern in the TOC daily, um, and ha have have data. And I, I believe some of that's presented in this report. But um, so it's it, it's it seems like it's a load thing, not just a flow. And uh, yep. Hmm. Hey. Diurnal variability. Thanks. I, I, I just had a couple of comments. I, ever since I discovered many years ago that Singapore is doing something along this line, I've kind of pushed for the idea of that kind of research. And it's great to see it having been done, basically. And to make one comment on Chuck's question, uh, the diffusion through the membrane while it's standing there is still going to be limited to those compounds that get through by molecular side. I mean, so it's not like everything that's in the uh, TOC is going to get through there in any great abundance. So it's really still going to be limited largely to the kind of compounds you're studying. I think something that we have to keep keep in mind also is is the the data that I showed that had the five peaks and only one met our um, our definition of a peak. If you look at the concentrations there uh, of those five peaks, including the one that was identified as a as an acetone peak from the isopropyl alcohol, it's extremely low, 0.25 milligrams per liter. It, it is nothing nothing like the 2013 um uh event that happened at orange county that the expert panel was correctly very worried about uh looking at all the additional data that we did and looking at the peaks uh that that we saw that were true peaks none of them compared to to that uh 2013 peak so i think when we're looking at you know operational changes in the in the toc bumps up a bit or the drift as Shane mentioned or or just an outlier if there's a bubble in the line of the of the analyzer we, we just saw numbers that were uh, far away from they, they couldn't be explained by by drift and they're above the uh, above that that defined threshold I think we have to look at, at the concentration and and really try to um, understand the importance of that uh, is relative to the 2013 peak. Excellent. Well, we've. Uh, I think we've. Ex looks like we've exhausted the questions for uh, for now. And we a reminder that we have another uh, Q and A session scheduled for a little bit later today. But right now, let's uh, transition with a thank you to Shane and John, and hope that you can you can stick around. I'd, I'd love to have you. Uh, be available later but i understand you guys are incredibly busy so thank you very much i appreciate your support thank you kevin and I'll, and i'll be here thank you so as, much as will I. yeah all right that's great thanks guys so now we are going to move uh to a discussion of the proposed chemical control criteria that's going to be brought to us by brian bernados brian is a a longtime contributor uh, both in this field, obviously, is a is an is an is a is a legend in the water reuse field in California and across the United States, and has been a, a very kind and benevolent contributor uh, to NWI and its projects. So we thank you for that support, uh, Brian. The microphone is yours. Well, thank you, Kevin. That was quite a nice introduction. I never thought of myself as a legend, but thank you. Um, so I'm going to cover our criteria. And specifically, I were going to refer the expert panel and others watching to look at these sections in our draft criteria. 
and 0.80. Next slide, please. So I heard a proverb earlier this week that said, don't tell me what you know until you tell me uh, who you are. So I want to spend some time telling you about myself. Uh, again, my name is Brian Bernadas. I have a PE license, civil engineering in California, and a master's degree. My undergrad was at Pitt, and then the master's at San Diego State. I'm a classified as a senior sanitary engineer with the state. I've been with the state for 29 years. Before that, I uh, worked in construction uh, with uh, Turner Construction, big company out of New York. Some of you have heard of them and also some other volunteer work and with consulting, uh, the old James M. Montgomery. So, but the last 29 years, I've been with the state. Primarily, it was the health department. And over the last six years, I believe it's the water board. So about half of that time, I was in the field office in San Diego. And uh, for eight years, I was a field engineer. And uh, I had the privilege of being involved early on with uh, the city of San Diego's repurification project, reviewing that as the engineer in charge of reviewing their documents. So I've been looking at reuse projects for most of my career, going back to 1994. And, uh, of course, that project uh, was uh, uh, harpooned by public sediment at the time, uh, although we, uh, we were uh, about ready to permit it in 99. But despite that, uh, that went away based upon the uh, city council and the mayor. But I knew it would come back, and of course it has. So they're under construction now with their current uh, project. Uh, for seven years, I was district engineer in charge of basically all the water in San Diego County and Imperial County. And, you know, when you're in the field and especially district engineer, you take that pretty seriously that you want to make sure all the water is safe for people to drink, including, uh, you know, uh, immunocompromised people. Then since 2007, I've been a technical specialist in the tech operations branch. And I know some of the questions yesterday were about alternative technologies. And one of the duties I have is to review alternative technologies and innovative technologies. And along with Randy Bernard and Eugene Leong, currently we, we do that. And we're, uh, we're fortunate to have the ability to devote that time. And so we have you know, equipment manufacturers coming to us all the time with unique technologies. And, and, We've been doing that, you know, and not only myself. I mean, I built on previous staff uh, like uh, Jeff Stone and, and uh, Rick Sakaji, and, and even before that, uh, Robert Holquist, who spoke yesterday. So, I mean, we've been doing this in California for many decades, and so we're, we're used to looking at alternatives and evaluating them carefully, and we do that. I've personally reviewed dozens of different disinfection uh, technologies, most of them UV, but also ozone and even pasteurization. So we, we, we do that in California and we share that with the rest of the country who often will look at our list or, or call us and we're happy to educate them. And, and on the other hand, we learn from the other states too. We collaborate with other regulators, especially technical specialists in other states and we uh, we learn from one another and it's great to collaborate with them. And then finally, I, I do have a uh, water operator license, grade five. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to pathogens, the criteria must control toxic chemicals, both regulated and unregulated. And so one of the goals of the criteria is to address the findings of the 2016 report, which is entitled here, the Expert Panel on Feasibility of Developing Uniform Water Recycling Criteria for Direct Polar Reuse. And uniform is emphasized because we want this to apply everywhere in California, 
all sizes and shapes. So I find this helpful to refer to this report throughout my talk. Next slide, please. So here's a picture early on with the esteemed panel. And most of these uh, people are on this current panel. So we're glad to have you. Next slide, please. So the Water Board funded research on a number of topics identified in the 2016 report. So yesterday we talked about DPR 1 and 2. Today we're going to focus on DPR 4, which was really well explained by uh, Jean and Shane. And that's on treatment for averaging of potential chemical peaks. This was very useful for the Division of Drinking Water. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, this is my summary of the panel. It can be boiled down to emphasizing that a DPR system needs to have features that exceed our current regulations for indirect total reuse. DPR must be reliable. It must have a diverse set of processes. In other words, we're speaking of robustness, and I'll explain that later. Diversion of off-spec advanced treated water and some averaging of potential chemical peaks is important. Next slide, please. Now, the potential health effects from chemicals in many ways are like indirect photo reuse. So in other words, groundwater injection projects and surface water projects must have reverse osmosis and advanced oxidation, as is seen here. Next slide, please. But the big but is there's DPR is different in two ways. And of course, we've been showing this graph, you know, for several slides already. And this was in the expert panel report. So one way it's different is there's no significant environmental buffer. And so even though this happened at Orange County Water District, this really wasn't a violation of our IPR regs, nor was it identified as a particular health concern by us especially because it goes into the ground and basically has at least three months and often six months of travel and diffusion in the groundwater aquifer. Plus, acetone is uh, not particularly toxic, uh, although uh, I usually try to stay away from my wife's nail salons. It personally kind of bothers me, but acetone is not particularly a health concern. Number two, uh, it's urgent to recognize and respond to eventual treatment deficiencies. And so depending on the environmental buffer or lack of it, uh, there, there's, uh, there's urgent need to recognize that problem. And I might point to a recent example of an indirect polar reuse project that recently lost disinfection and advanced oxidation on one of its trains of UV for a period of about 16 hours. And so we're still investigating that incident. So these things do happen. Next slide, please. So this is another figure. And I believe this is also sh shown by uh, Jean. Shows a uh, number of spikes uh, over five years. Next slide, please. So the approach in our draft criteria is to require the following. Enhanced source control, meeting the MCLs and notification level requirements, as was talked about by Kurt Suzy yesterday. Monitor and, if needed, develop additional notification levels as appropriate. So we want to stay on top of emerging contaminants. Provide multivariate advanced treatment, as I'll explain later. Address pulses of low molecular weight chemicals because those could get through the RO and AOP. Very few, but still some get through. Require specific chemical control points and critical limits. And require excellent control systems and response measures. Next slide, please. So I'm going to continually talk about different sections of our draft reg, and I would refer you to them. And let me point out that there's an important link between source control and the joint plan. Now, one of the comments we've got from a number of cities 
involves the roles of sanitary districts and public water systems. Now, our approach in our criteria is that the joint plan should address these issues and specifically source control. These different agencies that are normally independent will need to come together in an agreement to create a joint plan. And of course, a good example of this is the Orange County Sand District, the Orange County Water District, which has a very excellent cooperation and joint plan. The joint plan can work out the unique situation of each project. And we've heard a lot already from people interested in DPR. And so we know there's many different styles and shapes and, and types of DPR, and each situation can be dealt with through the joint plan, which is required. Next slide, please. So we require some additional monitoring in the collection system, which is important and was talked about earlier today. And of course, we want to be looking for contaminants of emergent concern and then disrupting chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Now, using a HACCP or Hazard Assessment Critical Control Point process, the joint plan should anticipate potential chemical hazards and try to address these potentials. Next slide, please. Now, quoting from the 2016 report, implementing a rigorous source control program designed to control the discharge of toxic chemicals and other contaminants into the wastewater collection system that serves the DPR system was one of their points. Continuing the quote, the source control program must include stringent sewer ordinances and ongoing surveillance. Therefore, next slide. Our draft criteria in source control section 64669.40 includes the following rigorous source control criteria. Includes a risk assessment, ordinances that utilize local limits, that go beyond the EPA pretreatment compounds to protect public health and DPR projects. Audits on a regular basis, an early warning of potential peaks, and a source control committee. Next slide, please. So the Water Board funded a special NWRI advisory panel on DPR source control. And this was one of the recommendations of the expert panel that we decided to take on our own outside of the WRF process. And so NWRI and Kevin Hardy helped us with that. It came out, they came out with a report called Enhanced Source Control Recommendations for Direct Pool Reuse in California. And these are, are, are the members of the panel, including Jeff Neiman, James Colston, who currently is with Irvine Ranch, but at the time he was with Orange County Sand District, which is widely recognized as having one of the best enhanced source control programs. Stuart Krasner, retired from MWD. Internationally famous Ian Law. And Amelia Whitson with uh, EPA Region 9. And I would note that uh, earlier this year, EPA, uh, US EPA put on a webinar which focused uh, prominently Amelia Whitson in describing pretreatment programs. Now, I know most of the people in California were watching and even other states. And so we were happy that Amelia was on our source control program. She definitely is an expert. Next slide, please. So from our report on the source, enhanced source control conditions for DPR, quote, the risk assessment and risk management are essential. A comprehensive risk assessment should include a thorough evaluation of source control program which is an important barrier, has been talked about earlier. And continuing the quote, it requires a complete inventory of all industries that have the potential to impact the wastewater collection system, the contaminants being discharged, and a plan to safely manage them. DPR should also incorporate a risk-based approach to identify and set limits for water quality constituents that could be present in industrial waste discharges including risk assessment and management procedures to establish local acceptance limits. Next slide, please. So our criteria specifies a risk assessment focused on DPR and on using local limits that are focused on the protection of public health. 
So for instance, a good example is the Orange County Sand District developed a local limit for 1,4-Dioxane, which not, no, would not normally have been part of the EPA treatment program. Our criteria is also requiring an independent audit every five years. Next slide, please. Now, Fish and Drinking Water has received comments on our requirement of an early warning system. But I refer you to the report on our enhanced source control recommendations for DPR. Quote, they say, an early warning system in the wastewater collection system is needed to initiate remedial action. The goal of the action plan is to quickly resolve problems as they happen and to prevent adverse water quality excursions. Now, just an aside, I'm sure many of you are aware of the really unique situation that recently happened uh, at Hyperion, where it wasn't a chemical, more of like a, a large load of debris overwhelmed the uh, huge Hyperion plant so that the bar screens were overloaded with whatever gunk and debris. They, they switched from the, their online to a backup, and that quickly got. Uh, basically clogged, and so they really couldn't treat the water. They had to actually discharge untreated wastewater to the ocean. And they're still investigating what happened, but an early warning system would have helped uh, if they had one, which of course is not required now in their EPA pretreatment. Next slide, please. So two of the most important risks in source control are non-compliant discharges and illegal dumping. Non-compliant discharges can be detected by enhanced monitoring at the points that the industrial user and illegal dumping can be detected by monitoring systems at nodal points in the wastewater collection system. Next slide, please. So our criteria in 64669.40 subparagraph D is the DIPRA through a joint plan shall implement a sewer shed surveillance program to receive early warning of potential occurrence that could adversely affect the DPR treatment. And that contains the following. Online monitoring instrumentation that measure surrogate or surrogates that may indicate a chemical peak resulting from illicit discharges. Also, notification of the pretreatment program to the DIPRA of any discharge that results in a release of contaminants above allowable limits, and monitoring of local county health disease surveillance programs. Next slide, please. So we have had comments that such a monitoring system is not feasible. However, these commenters are not aware of recent technology innovations that have come along and have been studied. So this is a project that's already uh, been completed and a follow-up project is now underway. So I refer you to this project, which uh, involved uh, the team of Corolo and the city of Ventura and El Paso. And uh, they, they basically demonstrated that such a monitoring system is feasible. And that uh, I would refer you to that, which you know they, they used, uh, uh, for instance, the CANDU system in Ventura, the SCAD system in uh, the city of El Paso. I would note that the Israeli CANDU presented during a recent seminar that was uh, internationally watched by and sponsored by the US EPA and Israeli a three-day collaboration on technology webinar, which was really fascinating. And so CANDU was one of the highlighted speakers. Uh, I would point you to a utility in Oregon, Clean Water Services. They presented at the 2021 Water Reuse Symposium, which you might be able to uh, go back and look at. And they had some really interesting videos showing their online system where they basically pick some off the shelf instruments and use their own control system. And then the uh, SCAN was used at El Paso 
and uh, that's a DPR system that's going to maybe be the first true DPR to come online in the next year or so. So this is feasible. Next slide, please. Next, I want to talk about the Source Control Committee. So subparagraph E says a DIPRA shall form a committee that includes representatives from all wastewater management agencies, partner agencies that operate treatment facilities, representatives from the industry, and other users that discharge. And F, a DIPRA must institute a continuous improvement process to address all aspects of the enhanced source control program. I have to say that that was really emphasized by our source control committee, that the continuous improvement process is really key. And that, that uh, you, 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 you set up a system, you monitor it, you see how it's working, and then you go back and improve it. And that's, that's really good for all processes, but specifically source control, we're still learning how to do a good source control. And so that's an important part. Next slide. So moving on to treatment criteria, a robust third chemical process is needed. So again, quoting the 2016 panel report, they said DPR practices need to provide the following features in addition to, I want to emphasize in addition to, the requirements already specified in indirect polar regulations for California. Quote, ensuring independent treatment barriers represent a diverse set of processes, in other words, robustness in the treatment train that are capable of removing particular types of contaminants by different mechanisms. Continuing to quote, this diversity provides better assurance that if a currently unrecognized chemical, and I would, as an off uh, aside, say that in 2016, I was not thinking of the perfluoridated, maybe some of your experts were, but uh, perfluoridated chemicals were not on my radar. Now it's the latest worry in the water industry, or contaminants that identified in the future, where there is a greater degree of likelihood it will be removed effectively by a treatment train, in other words, a diverse type of treatment train. Next slide, please. So 6466550 specifies our chemical control. And our treatment train must consist of at least separate, three separate treatment processes using diverse treatment mechanisms for chemical reduction. So it currently uh, requires ozone biological activated carbon, reverse osmosis, and advanced oxidation process. Next slide, please. And so we just heard from the experts in the DPR and that was an excellent report. As I mentioned, we, we've been uh, learned a lot from that. And to me, it boils down to five options. Let's talk about blending first. Now, blending certainly would work for any peak if there's enough blending. Uh, as you saw, uh, depending on what size buffer you have, uh, it depends on the blending, but it also depends on uh, what's actually being dumped the duration of it, and the proximity of how close it is to the intake of the treatment plant. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, variables. And so blending could work, but you would, need, you would need an awful lot. You know, as was pointed out, you might need 30 days uh, in the reservoir. So next, and that was recommended by the project, was ozone BAC. Now that works on formaldehyde which may pass through the ROAOP. And that's really what we wanted to address is those type of chemicals, the aldehydes, and some of the other things that was mentioned by Jean Debreu. Next option that they looked at was GAC. And of course that works. We know that that's used a lot for uh, water treatment plants that have certain uh, VOCs. It works on THMs, disinfection byproducts. It can work on uh, PFOA, PFOS, we're still learning about some of the shorter chain perfluoridated compounds, but uh, and most VOCs, but not all VOCs, not on highly polar VOCs. 
and not on formaldehyde. So that says was mentioned, there's air stripping, which again uh, is used for water treatment plants, specifically at uh, contaminated groundwater, where you know what the VOC plume is. And uh, it works on the VOC depending on the Henry's Law constant. So uh, contamination of benzene or uh, trichloroethylene or other things that are in some of the California groundwater, uh, air stripping does work, but it's limited. And again, the second pass RO would work, except again, it doesn't remove all the neutral low molecular weight chemicals. And it's very expensive, of course. Next slide, please. So again, from the 2016 report, to be feasible, deep car systems must meet or exceed the attributes of robustness defined as the presence of different types of treatment processes acting via different mechanisms, such that a yet unknown pollutant likely will be removed by multiple stages. And so our criteria basically includes the mechanism of biodegradation, an effective biodegradation component and a very effective separation and a very effective oxidation process. Next slide, please. So I'm going to focus on multiple independent barriers as that part of the reliability. Next slide, please. So in subparagraph A, we state that the deep air train must consist of at least three separate diverse treatment processes and include ozone BAC, reverse osmosis, and advanced oxidation. Now, this was the order that was evaluated as feasible in the 2016 expert panel report. Now, in response to some comments, we initially required the order to be part of our reg. I believe we've remove that as a specific requirement to allow opportunity for alternatives. Well, I'll talk about alternatives later. Next slide, please. So we also need to define the design criteria for each of these mechanisms. Now we already have uh, the separation criteria for RO and our existing IPR criteria. And we basically cut and paste what's in our recharge and surface augmentation into this reg. And the same with advanced oxidation. We use the existing criteria for that, which is the half log one four dioxane reduction. But we need a new design criteria for ozone BAC, which um, even though it's being used is still kind of a newer technology relative to RO and AOP. So we're still learning a lot about it. And so we need to have some criteria. Next slide, please. So in subparagraph C, we uh, have certain things required. And we relied a lot on the City of San Diego demonstration project, which is known has been operating for 10 years and studying and challenging the ozone bioelectric activated carbon. Now, the uh, San Diego Dissertation Project report was quoted in the 2016 expert panel report, which determined DPR was feasible. And really, the details are in the WERF Project 1412. And that's a pretty thick uh, report. has a lot of good detail in it. I recommend you read that. So it demonstrated you could achieve one log removal of formaldehyde, acetone, and, and DMA. The City of San Diego project was over 90%. And as was noted by Jean and Shane, um, most experts categorize uh, a process good if it removes 90%. Less than 90% is moderate and less than 50, of course, is poor. So we specify three indicator chemicals as a potential route to demonstrate an alternative to ozone BAC. We also specify a contact time of uh, empty bed contact time for the BAC of 15 minutes, which is in line with the San Diego study. Next slide, please. We also looked at literature and specifically refer you to the AWDA Water Science article of July 2020, 
entitled Persistent Contaminants of Emergent Concern in Ozone Biosertation Systems, Analysis for Multiple Studies. And so this was good because there's been a lot of work being done, but it needed to kind of boil it down to analysis of the different things that have been demonstrated around the country. And some pretty good people uh, were on this, uh, some who are on this panel. Now, um, the ozone design criteria, uh, we picked a applied ozone dose to feed water TOC to be equal to or greater than 1.0. Note that this, uh, this analysis article noted that the average in these studies was the ozone to TOC ratio of 0.9. So we think 1.0 is a good design criteria. Also, as a side note, I want to point out that often these chemical requirements produce really good pathogen log removal. And having a ozone to TOC ratio equal to one or greater pretty much ensures at least a one log inactivation of cryptosporidium, maybe even two. And note, Yesterday, we require, and I hope you caught that, four separate barriers that have at least one log removal credit. And so you want to operate the ozone BSC such that it meets that ability to be that fourth barrier. Next slide, please. So we have got some comments about what would we do with the satellite plan? And we certainly want to try to uh, allow that if, if it can be demonstrated. Now, some are proposing that uh, the RO and AOP be done at an advanced facility uh, and uh, used for indirect, indirect portal reuse projects, but at a point downstream in a long, uh, long uh, transmission main, maybe closer to a surface water plant, what would, what would we think of having the ozone BAC as a, at a separate plant downstream? Of course, if you're doing that, then the satellite plant would be a much smaller flow and be more cost effective. Next slide, please. So we've been asked, how would we define an equivalency? So working with some uh, experts, uh, notably the team at Trussell Technology, uh, we find that we could use these three indicator chemicals, formaldehyde, acetone, and NDMA. The first two, formaldehyde and acetone, as has been noted, pass through full advanced treatment, RO and AOP, and NDMA is created. So we wanna make sure the, the, the BAC is uh, appropriately removing uh, and having good biodegradation, and NDMA is a good surrogate for that. Also, although I think this would be more guidance, is the TOC is typically reduced by 30%. I think we removed that from our criteria, but that's good guidance. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ah, there we are, okay. Um, Oh, I think we, previous slide, there we are, okay. All right, I, did, I didn't see that. So now what about ozone BAC at a drinking water plant? And noted that some uh, surface water plants have ozone. So this is just my opinion. Theoretically, a surface water plant could demonstrate via the same indicators. Now we don't know exactly uh, if this will work, so they would have to demonstrate it, but they could using the indicators, as we mentioned before. Next slide, please. We also decided to include in subparagraph B, an option based upon blending. And that's in response to comments we've received. So this blend option would need to be a significant amount. And so we believe that basically a significant means a blend of 10% water from the ROAOP with 90% of other water that is effectively treated. 
However, we point out this is important. The process would have to be a continual blending process. This couldn't be just a seasonal blend. And the blend water would have to be an approved source. Next slide, please. So then the question becomes, well, what about if you can't meet that 10% blend continually? Could uh, it vary or could the DIPRA combine a portion treated with some side stream treated with ozone and a lower blend option? So we thought about this carefully and we've come up with an equation uh, that wouldn't, wouldn't allow it above uh, 0.5. But if it's between 0.1 and 0.5 uh, of the uh, wastewater contribution, WCC, WWCC, WWC, boy, too many acronyms. Uh, if it follows this equation, then that could be appropriate. And I have to give credit to uh, Jing for this and also Bob Holquist. So I did not derive this. And if you have questions, I'll have them answer those. It does work, we, we've tested it out. Next slide, please. So we had to add a definition for uh, wastewater contribution. That means the fraction equal to the quantity of municipal wastewater applied at a DPR project divided by the sum of the quantity of municipal wastewater and a dilution water to either an untreated source of drinking water upstream or of a water treatment plant previously approved, or a finished drinking water previously approved by the state board. So this would typically be permitted sources by our field offices. Next slide, please. Now, of course, that criteria needs to define the test protocol approval. The test protocol for the ozone BAC mechanism must be submitted, reviewed, and approved by DDW. So at the minimum, it's gonna to have to spike formaldehyde and acetone. They also need to spike NDMA, depending on uh, the occurrence in the secondary water. The proposed uh, ozone BAC process must be at the normal full-sized operating conditions. So a full-size treatment train of ozone BAC, that might be one or two or three MGD trains. Now I point out that this is the similar existing approach we've been doing since 2014 and even before 2014 when our rate came in, uh, was formally adopted. We've been using uh, test protocols to uh, evaluate the advanced oxidation that they have to demonstrate the half-log of one fordoxine reduction. So it's nothing new uh, in this approach, just a different process. Next slide, please. So now I wanna talk about, as the report said, we need to incorporate frequent monitoring of surrogate parameters at each step to ensure treatment processes are performing properly. Next slide, please. So our criteria includes a hazard analysis critical control point process in these subparagraphs. And I would refer you to read carefully through these. But basically in concept, it means continuous performance monitoring of at least one surrogate or operational parameter that indicates when the treatment is not performing as designed or integrity of the equi treatment equipment has been compromised. We already kind of do this with our IPR projects. Now, in the case of DPR, uh, a, a, uh, such a basically operational parameter is the ratio of applied ozone to TOC, where you're constantly monitoring the TOC dosed and the TOC online, and that ratio is an operational parameter that can be monitored constantly. Also, there's online um, observance analyzers frequently used. Online TOC, as has been mentioned earlier. And for the UV, uh, all the current advanced oxidation projects uh, either monitor calculated UV dose or energy in terms of what's called electrical energy delivered. 
that has the units of kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. So depending on the manufacturer, they either use a calculated UV dose or a calculated energy EED, which is power per flow. And of course the dose takes into account intensity, power, and flow. And those are all really uh, standard for UV and are very reliable instruments. And uh, of course, as I said, they need to demonstrate the treatment under normal full-scale operating conditions. Next slide, please. Oh, and I would mention that uh, we typically go out to inspect these plants uh, before we give final okay for them to discharge to the uh, IPR project uh, by going through looking at these instruments and their alarms. So we make sure that they're working. Now, um, addressing chemical peaks, the chemicals that may pass through the advanced treatment are low molecular weight and resistant to oxidation. So we have three components in our criteria. As I mentioned, the ozone BAC, another mechanism. Second, if you'll note that we have a requirement for continuous longitudinal mixing of the flow sufficient to attenuate a one hour elevated concentration of a contaminant by a factor of 10. Now note that this mixing uh, can be counted in between where it occurs at the wastewater plant inland chamber and the DPR project finished water compliance point could be used to meet this requirement. This is a mixing requirement. And lastly, I want to point you to online TSA analyzers, which again has been recommended by DPR4 and we're using to quite uh, a good tool for our reg. So the combined uh, RO permeate TOC, we have limits for that. So we consider a level over 0.25, a point where you want to investigate the peak and possibly investigate the source control program. So this is not a violation. This is a level where the uh, system, the operator should investigate what caused that peak. And as uh, the earlier experts mentioned, that might be just a train coming online. And so if that's the, uh, if that could be the, the, uh, the source, then that's the investigation. But you might want to look at the source control program. Did something happen? And uh, you go to your enhanced source control joint plan partners and find out, did they see something in the early warning system? Now over 0.5 PPM, we consider a criminal, critical limit, which could be an acute uh, exposure threat and we require automatic diversion at a TOC over 0.5. Next slide, please. Now we had to consider uh, disinfection byproducts because the expert panel said, advanced water treatment facilities sometimes employ an oxidant. In fact, all the ones that I know and I've inspected, I've seen all of them um, employ an oxidant, chloramines. This practice can result in the formation of toxic byproducts, in other words, THMs, and some of these are low molecular weight compounds, as I mentioned, chloroform, that are not removed well during reverse osmosis or might remain after subsequent treatment with advanced oxidation processes. So to address THMs and other disinfection byproducts, we have a trigger uh, where the combined TOC is over 0.1, um, that's not instantaneous, that's continuously for 24 hours. So in other words, that's a trend that should be investigated. And we require the performing a five-day THM formation potential study on our RO permeate to see if that might affect downstream uh, distribution systems in the drinking water system. You know, that's important for uh, meeting the THM rule. Also, uh, and of course note that that's uh, one significant figure. So up to 0.149 basically 
you would be doing the THM formation potential. But if you go to 0.15, exceed that, or continuously for five days, that invest means that basically your RO membranes are starting to degrade. And so you should invest, investigate the integrity of the RO membrane. Could be oxidation, over, over oxidating, and uh, weakening the membranes would uh, mean that they're passing more chemicals, or just some leaks that you should investigate. And again, this is on the combined TOC. Next slide, please. Now I want to talk about what's called a comprehensive integrity verification program. And I want to make the case that the 0 0.15 TOC trigger is an approach to comply with the US EPA long-term two enhanced surface water treatment rule, of which this is basically surface water. So the EPA membrane Fermentation Guidance Manual in Appendix A describes a comprehensive integrity verification program. And the actual rule in the Federal Register requires continuous integrity monitoring. So the LT2 in regard to microfiltration or ultrafiltration membranes specifies that there is an upper control limit for turbidity at 0.15, which is a trigger to start a direct integrity test. In other words, a pressure decay test, which is very common for MF and RUF. So I wanna make the case that an upper control limit should be applied to RO. And this is mentioned in the membrane filtration guidance manual also. Next slide, please. Now I want to talk about diversion and panel said providing the ability to divert advanced treated water that does not meet specifications. So we want to automatically discontinue delivery of water to the distribution system for the following acute or potential acute exposures. So as I mentioned, the treatment train does not meet the 0.5 TOC limit. Online monitoring of nitrate exceeds the nitrate MCL. And if installed, online monitoring of uh, perchlorate or lead, I understand there are now online monitoring of perchlorate instruments, and in the future may be lead. And of course, these are acute chemicals, especially lead that we don't want uh, affecting public health. Now, my last three slides, next slide, please, is going to talk about supporting material, which is includes technical, managerial, and financial capacity. The engineer report must specify the cost of specific elements, that includes facilities, staffing, and support services. The ongoing costs must be determined for operation and maintenance costs, the 20 year life cycle costs of equipment, capital replacement costs, energy costs, and personnel costs, and other elements. Next slide, please. So we're focusing on financial capacity. So reliable and continual funding sources must be identified for necessary costs. And the funding should include budget set asides for maintenance and capital replacement. So examples include UV lamp replacement. So typically, depending on the UV manufacturer, the bulbs are good for 10,000 to 15,000 hours, which is about a year, give or take the actual use, and depending on manufacturer. I recently was inspecting a, a, a large tertiary plant that is a 60 MGD capacity, and they said that they budget a million dollars per year for replacing the bulbs. Of course, that depends on your manufacturer and the plant size. Now, replacement of membranes is not as frequent, but it could be somewhere between five to 10 years. Uh, you have to replace all the RO and micro filters or open filters. So that could cost much more than a million dollars, maybe even 10 million, depending on the size. Next slide, please. Now I want to talk about operators and operator certification. And that was a real concern of the 2016 panel. So our regs require the operational designate at least one chief operator, at least one shift operator for each operating shift that possess valid Cal Nevada section of AWWA uh, and slash California Water Environment Association Advanced Water Treatment Operator or AWTO 
grade AWT5 certificate. Next slide, please. The operations plan says prior to operation of a DPR project, a DIPRA shall at minimum demonstrate to the state board the personnel operating and overseeing the operations have received the training in the following. First, op proper operation of advanced processes. Second, a knowledge of our Safe Drinking Water Act and its regulations. Uh, and that's why we had Kurt Souza go over that. It includes all knowledge of all our regulations for drinking water. Third, the potential adverse health effects with the consumption of drinking water that does not meet our drinking water standards, MCLs, NLs, and other standards. And fourthly, implementation of an advanced source control program. Next slide, please. Plan must address the certification and appropriate type and level of certification for each element or each treatment facility. That includes a plan that describes the staffing level of each plant associated with the DPR. So the AWTO is the minimum expectation. That's because existing state run wastewater or drinking water certification programs that are run by our state programs do not generally cover advanced treatment processes such as membranes, UV or ozone, or even GAC for that matter. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of a diverse group that worked for many years on the AWTO certification program. And this included experts from utilities like East Bay Mud, San Diego County Water Authority, Encenia Wastewater Agency, that's where Kevin formerly worked. I have to shout out to you, Kevin. Southwest Membrane Operator Association, Padre Dam, which is going to have a surface water augmentation project, San Diego, also a surface water under construction project, City of LA, San Francisco, LA County Sand District, Valley Water District, Santa Barbara, and Long Beach. Also, our representatives from DW, which is myself, you can see I'm in that picture, and also our Division of Financial Assistance that run our operator certification programs. And this was a neat collaboration between CWEA and Cal Nevada AWBA because it crosses over between the two agencies. And I was really happy that everybody worked together to come up with a good program. Next slide, please. Now I would point you to this website, awtoperator.org. So the capability operator is assured by this program. As they say on their site, drinking water treatment, wastewater treatment, or water use operators working at facilities using advanced treatment should be interested in earning the new voluntary operator program. AWT operators protect public health by ensuring a supply of safe and high quality drinking water. Now, again, we've received some comments that this is a lot to expect, but I spoke to the run, people that are running the program earlier this week and 105 people have passed at least one exam in the state of California. So I think that's a pretty good pool of people. And uh, next slide, please. I think that's the question slide. Okay, well, thank you, Brian. I appreciate the shout out. That was a very comprehensive presentation on a lot of different subjects related to chemical controls. Thank you so very much. Uh, your timing was excellent. It's about 11.48, so we have uh, 12 minutes for questions, and I'm gonna throw it to our intrepid co-chair, Mr. Jim Crook, uh, to facilitate the Q&A between now and our lunch break. Jim, take it away. Intrepid? Wow, I will. <laughs> okay, um, Brian, you covered an immense amount of material in that one hour, uh, a lot of stuff. So there must be questions from the panel. We will entertain any panelists. Jim, can I ask Brian a question? <laughs> sure. <Of course. laughs> uh, Brian, did the panels consider working with, let's say, selected industries to do either hauling, I mean, storage and hauling, or total relocation based on uh, the need. 
because you're adding a small amount of compound to a very large volume of water. Boy, I'd have to go back and read that uh, that large report enhance source control. Um, I'm sure that's one option. Maybe Kevin, you remember, um, you know, and, and I think um, I think Corolla has pointed out um, for one of their projects that is a small project that a uh, trailer court is probably one of the most hazardous things because they really don't know what they're doing that they could be dumping all sorts of stuff so you're right maybe maybe in certain cases dealing with the trailer court as separate might uh, uh, might be a good idea well I, I mentioned it Brian because from a cost standpoint you know uh, going through your added list of processes to remove a specific constituent it may well be cost effective to think about alternatives you know I mean the windhook system operates primarily on domestic and even thinking about sewer separation is not out of the question hmm. yeah I, I I personally don't see that happening in California but um, who knows that 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 would be a unique alternative I mean most cities they they take what they get and it's a mixture yeah but does it have to be that way I don't know you wrote the textbook <laughs> well I'm, I'm I've been thinking about all this Ryan because it's uh, I mean what you presented is is truly complex and comprehensive I mean I, I and it it represents an enormous amount of effort and there may be a, not ways to limit that effort but ways to reduce the potential problems from some troublesome industries I mean they're pretty well known well George as you know for most of my career we never would have considered DPR but uh, we've certainly evolved over my 30 years with the department <laughs> <laughs> and and I would say too, George, just really quickly to, if I could, uh, paraphrase what uh, that panel felt uh, and what they found on that issue. You know, their sense was that uh, you know the, the 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 survey of the sewer shed needs to be you know risk based, and that um, once we understand as well as possible uh, the, the the set of risks and the controls that are available to us, I think then you know at that point. Uh, then it becomes what's the most cost effective solution for that community to be able to consistently produce safe water. And I, I would think that all options would be on the table and where you have a, a big industry that's a, a large percentage of inflow, it might be different where you have a, a, a difficult industry where it's a very small percentage of flows. So I think they would have said, yeah, let's let's look at the risk assessment and then move forward with the right options for the community. But I think as, as George, the, the question kind of assumes it, it, this is an incredibly complex subject and we start talking about source control, it's where wastewater utilities and advanced water treatment utilities intersect with the, the economy directly. So it's an important subject and uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot to, to say on, this, on the matter. Right. Hey, Brian, uh, considering source control, um, do the regulations address illegal dumping of septic tank effluent that occurs all the time? I think that would be part of the hazard assessment. So it's not specifically called out, but we do require that hazard assessment, that risk assessment. Okay. Yeah, and often, uh, Chair Crook, that would be part of the local community's uh, sewer ordinance, those, uh, those specific kind of penalties for, for that kind of behavior. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I know, but but we found instances of that down in Orange County years ago. Uh, where it was happening? So, just checking. And it really Kevin, does happen. It is a really you know that's a great point. It is a real issue. Uh, this hazardous dumping. Kevin was was thought given to, for example, if if you have an agency, and they know that a discharger uh, is problematic that uh, they could couple and provide local on-site treatment of that waste before discharge? Right. Oh, that's a good question. I think, I think the answer is yes. 
I, yeah. I think that all, all options should be on the table, right? In order to make, uh, you know, if it, it includes, you know, diverting it or, or, or no discharge or very limited, I, I think all those options should be on the table. And I think that was the kind of the, the I, I don't want to speak of the panel, but what, that was kind of the thrust of their comments is that as long as it's risk-based, you know, the, 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 the truth of the matter is the, the national pretreatment program provides a lot of flexibility for utilities uh, to uh, take action to preserve water quality in order to recycle water. And uh, the, I think the truth of it is, is, is that um, it just hasn't been as well invested in a, a, a part of the uh, wastewater management enterprise. And I think what they're, you know, we're trying to, what the panel was trying to do was create that incentive for investment in this management barrier. So yeah, anything that makes sense within that kind no. of, that, that framework, I think is consistent with what the panel is doing. As I listen to all this, it seems that, you know, there's an enormous amount of energy put into dealing with a problem that, I, that might be dealt with otherwise. That's that's what my concern is. I mean, you've got sensors, you've got online monitoring, you've got hundreds right. of things. It may simply just be cheaper. I, we just haven't done this in the past. I mean, you know, we, we've just said that people can uh, implement processes or businesses wherever they want. But it was never done from the standpoint of direct potable reuse. Right. So it just seems to me that that a lot of rethinking needs to be done uh, as opposed to just more instrumentation, more analyses. Not that those those have to be done, I agree. But it just seems to me that some other approaches have to be investigated. Right. Okay. Very good, George. Uh, Jörg has, a, has, has wanted to ask a question. Jörg? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, thanks again, Brian. Very comprehensive, very informative presentation. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I, I want to limit it to the third chemical process. Um, mm -hmm. And I was also a little bit surprised about the specifics or level of specifics um, you, 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 you're trying to regulate, which uh, are comprising um, not just lock removal standards or values, but also treatment processes as well as operational parameters for these processes. Um, and I was not quite following your logic why you, for example, also um, specified a specific ozone dose uh, of larger than one milligram per milligram uh, as one example. If you go to this level of detail, I would argue that you also should then think about the um, transformation product formation potential at that level, or even if you reach that ozone um, dose when you have uh, scavengers uh, coming through from your biological nutrient removal process. So I think online uh, nitrate monitoring might be uh, something to also consider in the feed water uh, to that uh, facility. Um, and the other element, what um, I noticed is that you I think also based on what uh, Sean and uh, Shane presented, um, you settled on this combination of ozone and BAC as uh, as an additional treatment barrier with different removal principles. Um, but all I see in the regulation is specifying the empty bed contact time. You're not necessarily specifying how long this carbon is actually in operation, and what the, it will be a big difference whether you run 15,000 bed volume or 30,000 bed volume after which the adsorptive capacity is exhausted. So um, maintaining this adsorptive function uh, is not necessarily guaranteed if that's not um, uh, looked at. Uh, and just looking at empty bed contact time, I would argue this filter at some time will just become a biological active filter, but the adsorptive function uh, will be lost. So uh, I'm just wondering about the level of detail you want to put uh, into the regulation, I could, as I indicated, think of several other elements that uh, could easily be added. And um, maybe this also relates to the question George put up, um, how much detail uh, should really be in the regulation? Well, I would try to answer that um, in that I believe the mechanism we're really trying to focus on is not absorption the over time and you know based upon the studies being done a month or two months the absorptive capacity of the activated carbon goes away and becomes truly a uh, biodegradation process and 
my understanding then is that you don't really replace the biologically active carbon. You, you might refill it as some of it, you know, breaks down, but you would continue in the biological mode. And that what we're really trying to do is not remove necessarily um, those that GAC would remove on its own. We're trying to get those things like formaldehyde and acetone and chemicals that they represent that uh, get through the full advanced treatment, the ozone, I mean, the RO and AOP. And so it's that biological degradation mechanism that we want it to be operating in. And I know a lot of the studies that have been done get very confusing because they're run and they're in the transition period where they're absorbing some stuff. Uh, but long term, they, they become biological and, and that, that uh, decay decreases. And so the removal of the perfluoridated compounds, for instance, in these studies, you will, you will see different things quoted, but that's probably because as they start up, the, 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 it's mostly GAC. And so the perfluoridated compounds are being absorbed. But over time, that's not really the mechanism because we, we want to rely on the RO for removal of the perfluoridated compounds. And we want it to become biological. So you're dealing with the aldehydes and ketones that are mentioned. So I think the, the, the length, my understanding, I could be wrong uh, if, if Shane wants to talk about that, but I don't think the, the time is a component. I think the empty bed contact time I mean, we're proposing 15 minutes, and if you can demonstrate good removal at less time, certainly that's an alternative that we allow in our regs. So, uh, you know, I didn't speak a lot about alternatives, but we're trying to allow some innovation uh, of these processes. If I may break in, it's lunchtime. In the interest of keeping on schedule, um, we have a half hour lunch break according to my agenda and we can continue with these these kind of questions at that time is that correct kevin kevin's already gone to lunch i'll be around all day okay <laughs> no i just forgot to turn my microphone on i apologize but uh, yeah we uh, uh, yeah we've got uh, additional time left in uh, for uh, panel questions after the break. So yeah, if we go to lunch, I think coming back out of that, uh, Chuck Haas will be first up and uh, then we'll continue on. Uh, uh, one thing that we wanna make sure that we do is uh, just be aware is that let's, let's get back right at 1230 because we're gonna have to cut just a couple minutes before one o'clock uh, to make sure that we've uh, kind of arranged ourselves for uh, an efficient and full 30 minutes for the public comment period. So um, yeah, do come back at 12.30 and then we'll stop, start public comments uh, right at one. Um, and then after that, we can uh, go into our uh, closed session. So uh, enjoy your lunch. We'll be back here sharp at 12.30. Thank you. Okay, well, my clock is indicating it's 12.30 and I do wanna start promptly but as the panelists uh, join in, I, I do want to take just a moment uh, to speak to those who are uh, going to be making public comments here in a few moments. First, I want to thank you for choosing to participate and taking a, a moment out of your time to be part of this process. Thank you very much. Um, if you've received your email to make the public comment uh, sometime before one o'clock and when, whatever makes sense to you, you'll need to go to that link and put in the password. But as you join the video conference that I'm in right now, and I will be facilitating the Q&A session for you. As you enter this comment, I would ask uh, uh, a couple things of you. First, uh, mute your audio and visual, and then just kind of uh, stand by to, to hear your name. I'm gonna try to move uh, increments. That's about what we have time for. Um, Ms. Hamlin, Mr. Wetterow, and Ms. West are up. I think we'll start with Hamlin, Wetterow second, and West is third. And then we've got five other folks as well, but we need some transition time, and I wanna be respectful of everybody's three minutes. So I'm gonna give you a warning sign when you see me pop back in with my beautiful face. Uh, you'll know that you've got 15 seconds to wrap it up, and we're not gonna turn you off, but I really would appreciate everyone's uh, cooperation with our three limit minute time limit. So thanks so much. Um, okay, with that, with that, I believe,
where we left off was uh, we were in the process of having clarifying questions from the presentations this morning, and Mr. Haas was uh, was uh, was ready to go. Hi, Brian. You know, one one quick thing I was curious Hi. about. So you mentioned lead as a possible sensor, and I'm wondering about that selection because lead is usually not an issue at the end of treatment, but more so in the distribution system and in premise plumbing. Yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, lead is usually, yeah, the corrosion, and I'm on the NSF 61 committee. It's trying to, you know, address that. But uh, I think, you know, we, we just know that it's particularly toxic and, um, it's a potential thing that, you know, in the future, we might have an MCL separate from action level for lead. So it's almost like a placeholder, but that's, okay. I don't know. You're, 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 you're correct. We haven't seen lead as a problem in any other project. Uh, if no one else is up, uh, Brian, I had a, just a real quick question. Uh, when you use that TOC uh, greater than 0.5 as a cutoff, that's to divert the water. Now, what if you knew what was in that? If you say it was virtually 100% or some, some percentage of acetone, uh, as was experienced in, in uh, uh, Orange County, you wouldn't necessarily have to uh, divert, or I mean, from a health reason anyway. Well, certainly, if you knew what it was, um, and how many chemicals are out there, 100 million chemicals are out there, we, we don't know all the toxicity. Well, this is a different situation, Brian. You've got, got a peak, and if that peak can completely be described as acetone, that's what I, that's, what I'm putting up, do you still need to divert? Because you wouldn't, any health criteria for the acetone wouldn't demand it. Yes, but I would argue that we would want to, we would want to find out, start, stop the process and find out what that peak was. And so if it was acetone, well, yeah, you start up right away. It all depends how quickly it can identify, but you know, it, we don't envision this as being the only source. Um, yeah. You know, we're not really addressing that in our. But there be the permits will address that type of thing. You're going to have to have backup sources, but yeah. you know they, they should be able to run the the plant when it's off, uh, and still supply water either from their reservoirs in the distribution system or whatever. Um, you know, th th this is our opinion that we, we think we have to be cautionary and uh, stop the stop the flow and then investigate. OK. Why do I get that thing all hold down here? Chuck, did you have a question? Well, I should say another question. <clears throat> Questions there? Mr. Chair, Adam, any questions from you folks? No, sorry, Kevin. I, I, I thought Jim was going to take this session. I, <laughs> so where is he? Crook, are you there? I am here. <laughs> well, I'll take over. <laughs> Kevin took over, so I thought he was in charge from now on. <laughs> well, I think you know. I, don't, I think we. Uh, the only time we need somebody to make a decision is when we have a little extra time. And it appears at this point that we've uh, that we may have exhausted the panel's questions. But I, but I do want to make sure that we take advantage of having this opportunity with uh, not just Brian on the line, but but with all the rest of the assembled um, expertise here. Uh, I want to encourage the panelists, if you have any questions about what you've heard uh, over the last couple of days, this would be a great time to think about, uh, get that question answered, uh, especially before we move into the, some of the public comments in our closed sessions this afternoon. If you've got anything that's 
nagging you in terms of an understanding, this would be a, a great time to uh, to bring that up. And, and Jim and Adam, you may ident have identified a few things in and your conversation is too. But but uh, but I see I see uh, Jacqueline. I see you you, you may have worked. Uh, you may have a question. Yes, um, Brian. I really enjoyed your presentation. It was very Thank thorough. You. Thank and you. From a regular, uh -huh, sure. From a regulatory standpoint, um, I didn't see enforcement information in this document. Is that something that the DDW staff will be working on, or will your legal counsel be working on that? Because, in my experience, you know, you need to have a, a strong enforcement piece, particularly if you're going to go into a high risk technology. Um, yes, I, I think that. Certainly, requiring the diversion is probably the most important thing. Um, did we talk about notification yesterday? The public notification is probably, I thought Jing might have talked about that. If not, maybe we could get Jing to jump in. But uh, certainly, there are the regular EPA public notification requirements and state requirements for uh, non-acute. Uh, chemicals that uh, there's tier one, tier two, and tier three, and so we would follow. It, it would follow basically any of the drinking water uh, regulations that we already have. This is going to be drinking water. Uh, it's going to have a a water supply permit issued by our field offices with assistance mm -hmm. from our tech branch, and the permit will probably go into more detail as far as. Uh, what the actions would be, but we, we, we certainly, you know, maintain our ability to issue citations, to uh, issue compliance orders, to issue fines like we normally do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I was, uh, became emphasis at the city of San Diego for issuing them a fine number of years ago. So they, all the people are probably gone, so they probably forgot who I am now, but yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. we, 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 we don't, uh, we will find even the big cities. So I have done that. Okay. I was curious because, you know, with the LPAs uh, that the counties uh, regulate and monitor, uh, we have some that are very, very small water systems that might, you know, feel that they could take this on and might actually get permitted. But uh, our experience has been that they don't have a lifespan that's sustainable. And so, you know, we had to take enforcement action and we, Oftentimes, the regulations were not stringent enough to make a significant impact in a short, particularly in a short run. It was always years and years and years of operation before we could get them to do, you know, hardly anything. Mm. That's, yeah, kind of that's a good point. Um, I think, you know, we, we used to be early in my career, we only had one attorney. It seems like now we have four. So that's good news. I, I, I'm, I'm really impressed. The Water Board has put in the resources to give us attorneys, and uh, we, we've actually won quite a few suits. We we have uh, we won the suit for ELAP just this week that was trying to question our ELAP regulation, and we won that lawsuit. And so, um, but anyway, I, 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 I as far as a small system, we don't necessarily limit the size, but we would be very careful about who we would allow. They, they would have to go above and beyond to prove they have the technical, managerial, and financial capacity, including they'd have to have, you know, probably one person devoted to source control all by themselves. So for a small system to do that, I mean, because that's what it takes. And if you talk to the experts, they will tell you that, you know, going to enhance source water control. I was just on a call with Corolo and an existing project that they're looking at source control more and more. You have to staff up just for source control. So and, and above all the other stuff, and they'd have to have uh, a uh, AWT 05. So for a LPA to get the AWT 05, um, although, you know, I have to say there was one small system, great in community service that had a, a T5 and a pasteurization system. So you never know, they, they had the ability to operate that pasteurization system. They're the only ones I know that are doing that, but uh, so it, it, it depends on just how good they are. 
but thanks for that comment. That that's very well. Uh, we certainly want to keep an eye on that. I think, uh, Mr. Chair, I understand that Shane Snyder has a question as well. Shane, I'll take my shot here. Thank, thank you, Brian. It was a, a really great presentation. I enjoyed reading through the the draft regs as well. And I, I'm not sure if this is really the time to dive into it, but I'm very curious uh, to follow up on something that Jorg asked, and that was the decision around this one-to-one uh, -one TOC ratio in dosing that into wastewater. Having worked on that in the past, and actually here I'm in Singapore, we are still looking into ozone in different aspects. That is, that's a pretty tricky one to accomplish. I mean, you really need to think about the, I don't have a question so anyway i was just curious again to to clarify are you are you looking at this one to one toc ratio for disinfection or contaminants or what's really the goal because i don't think you mentioned um, crypto i don't see that the crypto is going to be an issue with ro and uv following so i just want to more clarification on how that one to one came well, it, it's primarily for the chemicals, and so it, it, this this is primarily a chemical mechanism. But as you know, one of the happy coincidences is that when we required advanced oxidation, you know, in 2014, you have such a high UV dose that you get six log kill of everything. I mean, with just absolutely many times more. So, so, so that the chemical helps with the pathogen. And I just kind of related that to say that, you know, th th that you remember you have to have a fourth fourth process besides RO, MF, and uh, AOP. Those would be the three that are in the IPR regs that give you one law of crypto. Chlorine can't. Um, so you, you would need some sort of ozone uh, to get that fourth barrier. But so that's, that's just the coincidence and the the 1.0 is is not necessarily you know set in you know stone tablets the, if you can demonstrate the formaldehyde removal uh at a lower ratio i think I think we'd be you know they'd have to prove that so uh, and i know bromate could be an issue and there, there there's ways to deal with bromate i i know that you know hampton roads has you know, been working on that as well. And so it, it, it's still, you know, I, I'm amazed that we still don't know everything that we have to know about ozone BAC, even though it's been around and, and we're still learning. So thanks for all the good work you've been done in the past. But uh, yeah, good comment. And, and Brian, just to clarify a little bit more, it's a one-to-one -one against the TOC, but no residual required. Is that right? You're not That's looking at the correct. residual then how are you going to get disinfection credit without a residual? That's what I'm curious about. Well, I, I, I wish that uh, we could get uh, Shane Trussell on. I, I think they've they've studied that. And one of the graphs that was in the 2016 report kind of showed, you know, that uh, you were getting about too long crypto. Um, so, so Shane, maybe you can bear, bail me out here. I mean, so it requires the ozone residual to be monitored, though. So I think Shane's where, where Shane was going is is how how we got those those CT calcs. So uh, there's actually multiple uh, ozone analyzers, um, and we're we're calculating it using the integrated method, um, and it's the the same method being used at the drinking water plants uh, for permitting throughout uh, California. Um, so. I, I think the comment still stands, Brian, and some of the dialogue we've been having too on, on those on TOC ratio, meaning, um, you know, what what is the the real benefit of of being so dis prescriptive and requiring one, versus what what are the objectives of of that ozonation process? And I think that's where Shane and, and Yorg's earlier comments are going to. Well, I think we wanted to have a criteria there, 
uh, and, and we relied on all the work you you've done and San Diego's done and, and other people have done. So, um, but we will consider alternatives and uh, those three indicators, I think, are the way we would uh, determine whether uh, it, it's effective. And yeah, and so along those lines, I'll just finish off by saying we, we have been up around the one. And that, that's, I think, what you're getting at um, yeah. for, for quite a long time. Um, and recently, though, and, and that was more to achieve somewhere around two uh, logs of crypto, we reduced that to reduce the amount of bromate we were forming. And now we're a little bit under that. Um, but I, I think there's there's some need for dialogue here about the ozone TLC ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was curious because if there's nitrite or something like that, a one-to-one -one TOC will be irrelevant, right? I mean, at some point, it's not about, the, I don't even see the value of the TOC other than a maybe a general barometer. It will be the residual, I would guess. But anyway, I was I think it helped. And, and Shane, you, you helped me understand a little bit more where it's coming from. But I'd be curious to see how it's fine-tuned. Thank you. Maybe just a quick follow-up, Brian. Um, Sure. Uh, I still hear uh, we're mixing up objectives. So uh, I think your argument is that you want a third um, treatment barrier against these peaks, but the argument is all about crypto pathogens. Um, the the study you cited uh, in your presentation actually um, the highest or well, the average was actually 0.87, and um, this was an average across different studies where they also had treatment objective to remove pathogens or inactivate pathogens. So if you just look at chemicals, you only need 0.3 to 0.6 uh, to have 80% uh, removal, for instance, or whatever the target might be. Um, so I don't, I don't quite see the logic that you round it up and you argue now on pathogens rather than the chemicals. Well, I, I am uh, mixing my metaphors, I suppose, but I, 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 I want to just point out that there's several benefits to having the 1.0. Um, I think the point I want to emphasize is we, we have the ability for projects to propose something less, as long as they can use the indicators, demonstrate the 90% removal of those three indicators. So. I think that would be uh, the approach um, that each project could do. So to play devil's advocate, in the world we're living in today with climate change and uh, carbon neutrality everyone is after, um, it might also be worth looking where we can actually save energy, where it is not necessarily needed. And this would definitely be a point where you waste a lot of energy if you go beyond 1.0, in my opinion. Point noted. Brian, one more quick question. Is the ozone BAC one unit process or two? Is the BAC counted as a separate unit process? At, you know, you said there's four processes required, but is ozone BAC one or two? We're thinking of it as a single process, the combination of the ozone creating uh, the biologically activated media. So, it, it, you know, it, it, otherwise it would be a GAC process. Okay, thank you. Okay, these are some great questions, Mr. Chair. Um, panelists, other questions? We still have uh, almost 10 minutes. So, uh, any other questions for Brian? Well, it sounds like we've got, um, uh, looks like we've got Brian, Shane, uh, John. So so each of the presenters you've heard from over the last couple of days is here. So I think uh, in the interest of, of wanting to make sure that you feel like you've had a chance to answer any questions, I'll, I'll ask again if there's any members of the panel that have a question. And, and, uh, and if not, Mr. Chair, I'll ask your pleasure. Uh, what we should do now. We, we, we definitely have a, uh, we want to start right at one o'clock on our public comments. 
and we've got 30 minutes for those comments. We have eight public speakers, and we're gonna limit the comments to three minutes each because we believe that by the time we get through the interface with each of the eight speakers, we will have a lot of used up the entire 30 uh, minutes. So um, we've got some, we've got some uh, work to do to facilitate those comments. And I would say, Mr. Uh, Chair, you, you may wanna say a few words to the panel about uh, kind of the, the, the issue we were talking about earlier with panel, you know, the, the response to these kind of public comments. I think uh, what we had talked about as a group that, you know, these comments are, are, are here, uh, an opportunity for these folks to, to speak directly with DDW uh, as a panel member. It's a wonderful uh, point of information, a data point to consider in, in all your deliberations, but there's no expectation or need today to feel like we've got to respond to these comments specifically. Uh, they have uh, importance uh, in, in as much as our context is given, and uh, we want to consider uh, all the the, uh, the ideas that the community of interested stakeholders uh, want to bring forward. So we'll do that today, uh, but we're not going to respond to them uh, directly in any way. And in fact, when we get done with the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the public comment session, we're going to transition directly into closed session, which is going to require that we log off this, uh, this meeting and move uh, to a, a whole separate uh, meeting space. So we'll cover that um, as we get to the end of the meeting. But I think, um, Mr. Chair, yeah, like I said, we've got probably still seven minutes and we could take a break for a few minutes and just kind of tee up the public comments next or uh, anything else that you think might be useful at this time. Well, uh, we still have time for any additional comments from, from anyone uh, on any of the subjects that we've heard either today or yesterday, just since we have some time. Um, and we can handle those. If not, we can take a break for another four or five minutes until we start the, the other session. Mike, do you have a question? Yeah, no, it's just a quick comment. I, I, I'd like to really compliment the presenters today. Brian, Shane, and Jean did a wonderful job of laying out what can be a pretty complex set of issues. It was, it was very nice and very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So just to make sure, Yog, I see you lit, lit up there. Do you have a? Yeah, actually, since we still have um, Sean and uh, Shane around, um, and um, Brian gave this really very detailed insight on how important the TUC monitoring at the tail end of the treatment plan is, um, and even minor changes could trigger certain actions. I was wondering, uh, from your experience, whether you would recommend um, redundant TUC analyzers at the tail end to be more certain in some excursions to not uh, initiate the wrong measures at the wrong time? What's your opinion? I, I don't think that necessarily, well, and Shane, you can join in after. I don't think it needs to be prescriptive at this time, but it seems like that's the way folks are going to to have um, redundant TOC analyzers. Shane? Yeah, right, I agree. I'm, I'm not sure the regulation needs to, and it could, I guess. I, the, the agencies will lean that way um, because they, they're gonna wanna make sure that, that that TOC reading really is increasing and not just an artifact of the meter. I mean, the, the meter still, we're learning, you know, as, established as they are we're still learning about them right? uh the the change out and the make change out of reagents and maintenance associated with them is not per the manufacturer um in these environments so i i do i would think it's sort of what john was saying that that anybody pursuing a dpr project would be likely to purchase two meters um in particular on the auto permeate location randy do you want to jump in yeah, actually, I just wanted to make a quick comment, um, and, and this is for you and Adam to remind the whole panel as you guys are doing all your deliberations. Um, after the, uh, you know, over the last two days, we've given a lot of different presentations on on the basis and and on some of the details of our regulations. But I just wanted to make sure that it was clear to all the panel members that the the charge of the panel is to take the language that we're proposing. And, and in your expert opinion, let us know if it's protective of public health. So we do appreciate any comments you give back as far as alternative language or different ways of doing things or another way of thinking about it. All, all that is great and we can look at that. 
but the primary charge is just to make sure that that what we are presenting and what we've determined so far, if that is protective of public health or not. So I just wanted to reiterate that, and I'm sure you and Adam were going to talk to the the panel members about that after also. Yes, yeah, sure. Randy, we, we appreciate that distinction, but as but as you just said, uh, in getting to that answer, uh, understanding sort of the logic and the rationale and and sort of the what and why and where is absolutely necessary. So. Yes. You will, as part of our work groups, get comments back, which, you know, we will hopefully talk to you before and resolve um, as we work towards uh, developing the, uh, the, the finding in terms of adequate public health protection. Oh, yeah. We, and we, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Adam. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and I was going to say, no, we, we look forward to the, the, the questions and, and it helps us to solidify what our thinking was uh, to justify it to everyone. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we didn't go off on a rabbit hole or, you know, down another trail as far as, hey, why don't we tweak this or fix that? Because it is a very tight timeline that we're on. So, yeah, no, no, agreed. Actually, in, in the close session, we're going to be talking about how we structure things to get to the summer of 2022. <laughs> we, we, we realize what the ultimate goal is, Randy. Perfect. I just I just had to say it because if I didn't say it, then it, it <laughs> just had to keep it out there. <laughs> Yeah, okay. no, I think it's absolutely it's I think it's absolutely essential. And Mr. Chair, I think that uh, we did a great job of using this last few minutes really productively. So, hey, Randy, thanks for jumping in there and providing that uh, that quick clarification. Why don't um, I think it's twelve fifty eight, and if if you're okay with it, uh, Jim, I'm yeah. going to kind of start speaking to our public commenters and making sure they're teed up so they get their whole thirty minutes. I I feel uh, obliged to do everything we can, and you've been such a great and support a panel at this point. Let, let's get them started right on time. So uh, I'm going to start my comments now to the public commenters. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned earlier at the top of the hour, uh, you know, thank you for uh, participating in the process. We're looking forward to this. We've got eight folks who are going to make uh, public comments today. Uh, we've got 30 minutes. And I think because of, owing to the format and transition and uh, maybe a little bit of overrun, I think what we need to do is limit you to three minutes. So what I'm going to do is as I'm going to time you on three minutes, when you see uh, my smiling face come back up on the screen, you'll know you're at about 15 seconds. Um, that'll give you uh, that's going to give you a clue to kind of to, to wrap up your comments and transition so that we make sure that we can get everybody the same opportunity that, that you have. So I think this is a, a really healthy part of the process. And I look forward uh, to, to, to hearing and oh, I, we continue to record all these public comments. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the panel is not going to respond today. And, uh, and uh, what we will do, though, is take uh, all these concepts uh, under consideration. I think the panel is looking forward uh, to these comments as much as the NWI staff is. So uh, with that, our first public commenter is Cheryl Hamlin. Uh, Cheryl represents herself. And uh, so Cheryl, if you can activate your camera and your okay. microphone. Okay, there we go. There we go. We can now see you. Oh, and wonderful. I appreciate, your, I appreciate your patience. And and uh, we're going to start you as quickly or uh, close to 1 o'clock as possible. So uh, please start your comments. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It was a marvelous meeting. It's, it was just overwhelming, the depth of the research. I did submit a written uh, page, which I hope you can distribute. It's too long to uh, write about talk about but I you did cover many of the things but several of the items that were not covered here have to do with human pathogens so for example antibiotic resistance and um, that's been documented as appearing in wastewater also you know that the state of California is about to allow human composting so you're going to get more antibiotic resistance that way um, I would also like to mention prions um, those have been detected in wastewater, and you didn't mention those. You did mention COVID, which was good, and I love your new tool. I think that was good thinking to have that tool to analyze the water. Um, and then finally, um, one thing that concerns me, and that's the statistics. Uh, you talk about infections per year, but frankly, there's nothing about deaths as a result of these infections. So. 
is there any way to translate these uh, infections into deaths? Um, and I would say I would yield the rest of my time and uh, hopefully you can read my document that I submitted. Cheryl, thank you very much. I think as I mentioned earlier, Greg Wetterow is up next. Uh, behind Greg will be, and we'll hear from Jennifer West. And, and then after Jennifer, it's Craig Lickie from Black and Beach. So um, Greg, are you on the call? Greg Wetterow. Let me be, maybe getting some extra time here. Greg, are you on the call? Okay, we're gonna move uh, Greg now. Greg, I'll, I'll keep you on the list, uh, but we'll move you to the bottom. Um, and that's why I wanted to make sure that uh, we had somebody kind of teed up. Uh, Jennifer, you would be next on the list. So Jennifer West, representing Water Reuse California. And behind her is Craig Lichty. Uh, Jennifer, can you turn on your camera? I'm trying to turn on my camera. Um, maybe it's best that it's not working. Let's just move on here. <laughs> Let's move on. Thank okay. So my, my comments will be short. Um, so first I wanna thank very much um, NWRI and DDW for putting on um, the expert panel. It's been a long time coming. It's extremely exciting. To, to be here um, and to be participating in this. Um, I wanna compliment you on your layout of your process. The meetings, it sounds like you have a number of really um, appropriate and productive work groups that are, that are planned in the future. We appreciate the fact that you said yesterday that there'll be a report back to the public on what will happen during those work groups. We think that's really important. Um, we encourage you to keep up the public comment section of these, um, of these meetings. Um, I would suggest that potentially having a public comment for each day would be better because then there's more um, opportunity for interaction with the public. One of our main comments um, and our issues was around um, the prescriptive nature that, that Water Reuse California made and, and a number of other um, agencies made as well. The prescriptive nature of the ozone BAC requirement for the DPR regulations. It sounds like in the presentation, there's going to be some flexibility in this um, section that will help us respond to innovation, which will no doubt be coming. Um, we very much appreciate um, your listening to our comments in this regard, and we really look forward to working with you um, going forward on this, and we will be participating um, uh, throughout. So thank you. Okay, good. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, next up uh, will be Craig Lichty, representing Black and Beach. Craig, are you on the line? I'm not sure I see Craig. Again, we'll move Craig and Greg to the bottom of the order. And now uh, the next people up uh, would be Aster Tang and uh, Craig Catawalder. Aster, are you on the call? I see her either or him. Not seen her. Aster, one last try. Okay, we'll continue to move on then. Uh, Craig Cattlewalder, I know you're there representing the Surfrider Foundation of South Bay. Um, can you turn on your camera if possible? Uh, if not, uh, the, the microphone is yours. Yeah, Kevin, I'm going to leave the camera off. I'm not fully healed from some recent facial surgery, so I'm going to spare you and everybody else that image. But um, yes, my name is Craig Padwallader, and I've been active with the Surfrider Foundation, primarily the South Bay chapter, for nearly two decades now. I'm also on the Hyperion 2035 Technical Advisory Group and Community Advisory Group. And um, we're really, really eager to see, I know I am especially, and a lot of my colleagues are eager to see DPR become a reality. The Hyperion plant, which discharges roughly 250 million gallons per day of secondary treated effluent into the Santa Monica Bay, um, there are plans to recycle 100 
percent of that, I think, as everybody knows. And we would like to see that go directly to drinking water. And that's why we're so grateful for MWRI and the experts on these panels, which are truly impressive. And we appreciate the work that's being done. Given that Mr. Bernadus uh, mentioned this earlier, but the recent spill of some untreated effluent into our um, output from the Hyperion plant because of the flood, um, I'm wondering if sewer shed monitoring should be heightened in the uh, analysis of these projects. Um, I did go on a tour through the plant. I've been in touch with the plant manager and LA San and the different regulatory agencies. And this has impacted as well the Hyperion Municipal Water District's recycling facility where they had to adjust their uh, output and blend with potable water because of issues from the flooding at high period. So I'm wondering if that would be um, included in the analysis to make sure that sewer shed monitoring is there. Also, we would like to see a comparison against ordinary tap water. These standards are outstanding to protect public health, but it would be good to have a comparison to what actually comes out of the tap now. And that might be surprising that the output of recycled water uh, being cleaner than what's coming out of your tap. But we'd like to talk to the public intelligently and just give kind of a comparison to help um, educate these folks. And then finally, um, just wanted to get an idea, is the December 31st, 2023 deadline going to be realistic without an 18 month potential extension? And given all the things on your plate, we're hoping that will come true and that influences other projects that are being considered and the sooner the better in our opinion but um, thank you for all the expert work and input uh, we really really appreciate it dpr as drinking water is absolutely the way to go and um, we hope that um, this panel can um, complete its analysis and um, deliver that so that we can get some results sooner rather than later. Thank you very much for your time and thank you everybody for your contributions to this important subject. That's all. Thank you. Okay, next uh, speaker up is uh, Mark Donovan representing GHD. Again, I do not see Mark in and He's got a colleague, Mark Ware, from GHD as well, who I don't see in as well. They may have simply taken advantage of the opportunity to submit a written comment for the record and then not testify today. But I do want to take a moment to encourage them, if they are on the webcast, to try to log in and get and, and get your comment in. Why don't we just take a, a breath here for a moment or two and let uh, either Greg Wetterow, Craig Lichty, Aster Sang, or either of the two folks from GHD to log in. I don't want to move on before um, before we give them a chance to, to to get back in if they're having a technical difficulty. So maybe one minute for them. I know it'll seem like a long time, but I appreciate your patience. Well, I'm not sure we'll make it a whole minute. <laughs> well, while we're waiting for them to jump in, Mr. Chairs, um, we obviously are a few minutes ahead of schedule. We got done with that, that public comment period in 10 minutes, not 30. Um, before we move on, I would I think I'd like to ask um, what the next what the next uh, thing to do is. Should we go ahead and move into our closed session and take advantage of the extra time there? Or are there any other um, clarifying or uh, other sorts of questions that either the panel has for DDW or DDW has for the panel uh, before we go into closed session? Mr. Chairs? I'm ready to, to move to closed session. We don't have any more public uh, public speakers. I am too, unless D 
DDW uh, has has anything for the panel? This is Jing. I don't have anything. Thanks. Excellent. I think we, yeah, I believe that we have discharged our duty. We've completed all of our uh, agenda items that uh, were set for day two. That means we've had two full days, uh, Mr. Chairs, and I'm looking forward to getting into this, uh, to this working session. However, uh, in order to do that, uh, Suzanne has sent an email out with a separate link. That'll make sure that we all can leave this conference area uh, safely and then proceed into closed session and establish a secure connection there. So at this time, I'd like to uh, give anybody from the State Water Board a last opportunity to say uh, uh, anything they want to say. Bob, you want to say something or you just want to say goodbye? No, absolutely. I want to say something. Uh, thank you to the expert panel for, for the job you're doing and for the job you will do. As you heard, um, we have a lot of great experts on this panel and this means a lot to us. And, will be significant not only for California, but I think the rest of the world. So we, I really appreciate all your efforts and time that you're spending on this. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to declare uh, this meeting closed. Uh, experts, if you would log off uh, as you can and then uh, follow the instructions in Suzanne's email uh, from about 1253 and you'll be able to log into the new uh, the new conference center. Uh, in the meantime, I'll speak to the folks who are in the webcast. Thank you for, for, for participating today. Uh, we look forward to our next panel meeting, which will be uh, widely uh, disseminated in terms of schedule. Uh, we'll try to do everything we can to make sure that uh, this process feels as open uh, to you as we can. And we, and we really appreciate your participation. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can contact us here at NWRI. Uh, but most importantly, thank you for, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, taking part today, being a part of this process, and for helping us uh, create new sources of healthy water for all Californians. Thank you. Take care. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Kevin.